Welcome to Poker Fraud Alert Radio. I am Todd Dandruff Wittellis, and this is part two of the show, which aired on November 6th and 7th, 2023. It was over eight hours, so what I ended up doing was splitting it up into two parts. The first part was posted on November 8th, and that was over four hours, and this will be a little short of four hours, but overall, it was more than an eight-hour show, so it was going to take me a long time to edit, so I figured half of it quickly is better than nothing quickly. But this is the second half, and for fans of Brandon, you'll be happy to know that he is with us the entire time on this second half. So here comes part two, picking up where we left off at the end of part one. Enjoy. What we will do is we're actually going to move on to something that is not Vegas related, but is related to me, and I'm going to have you play a little game. You ready for it? I'm absolutely ready for it. Okay, I knew you'd like this this one. So we've done something similar to this before, but this is going to be simpler. This is just very straightforward and to the point. I'm going to give you five brief facts about me. And you have to tell me if they're true or false. Unlike other times we've done this, I'm not going to tell a whole story or anything like that. I'm just going to give like a one or two sentence statement. And then you can tell me whether it's true or false, we're going to go through all five before I tell you the answers. And if you do know one of these from things I've told you privately, um, don't say you know this from what I told you privately. Just say true or false. And then uh, um, then we'll, we'll go over each one individually about why you said what you did. And I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. And of course, I encourage the audience to play along and, and think to yourself whether you believe these are true or false. The only guarantee I will give all of you is that there are some true and some false here. So it's not five true, zero false. It's not zero true, five false. There's now, at are least there any of them that are, have a little bit of truth, but overall it makes it false. Or are they all blatantly false or 100% true? Um, I guess there's some true sprinkled. That's, in a, some of that, that's a good question. But yeah. the short answer I'm going to give is it, there's going to be a, either a clear true or clear false here. Even if they might or might not be based upon fact that, that they're either a completely true statement or, or, or they're a false statement. Even if they're there, they could be close to a true statement. They may be false. So, but there's no tricks here. It's just, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I'm just saying that I don't want any complaints later that because something I was saying had a little bit of truth to it, that it was technically a true statement. It's not just, it, it, they're either true. Wait, would someone actually complain about this? Probably, yes. Complaints in the past? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll get my complaints. Yeah, I get, I get complaints about everything. All right. And is there a prize I can win? Because that makes it more motivating. Oh, I have to motivate you with a prize. Okay, let me think here. Okay, how about I give you a free night at the El Cortez? <laughs> is that real? No. Okay. I wish it was. Would you take it if it was real? You know, that's the first... That's- well, you know what? Uh, I have never stayed there, so that would just I would do it because the property is, has been remodeled, refurnished over the last few years, and it's just one of the few properties I've never stayed at in my twenty plus years living here. So, knock it off the bucket list. So, yeah, I would. Oh, okay. I was trying to take something I thought you wouldn't want to stay at. Damn it! No, I mean, like if you said like the Gold Coast or something, no, but no, the Old Court I'd stay there one. Mm, okay, yeah. well, I, 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 I picked a. I mean, okay, I'll take the offer. Sure, <laughs> right when I get the when I. Do you, have, do you have any method of getting me one night? No, unfortunately, I, I don't. I have no connection to the El Cortez. No, it was a, it was a joke prize. Right, for, we'll play. We'll play for pride. Okay. That's, well, that's not a bad one. Like, I mean, I mean, that's a bad one. Like, why would I reject that? Like, that's not. It's not a dump. It's actually semi nice now. Mm. Uh, your boy Vegas Matt films from there all the time now. Yeah. Well, it's actually that nice that he 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 has something going on because he's there a lot. True. Okay. Well, I guess that was a bad gag okay. prize. Okay. So, the first one. The girl who took Druff's virginity, and by the way, I'm doing these in third person, so if that feels weird, too bad. The girl who took Druff's virginity in 1989 has poker tournament caches listed on Hendon Mob. True or false? God, where'd you you come with a question like that? Um, Wait, tell me again how this works. I guess, and then you tell everyone the answer? At, At the end of all five questions, I'll tell you the answers. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, Jesus. Um... Because it's such a weird question that I think you... I'm going to do reverse psychology that you expect someone to say no. I'm going to say true. Okay. Moving on. 
Druff once won over 1,500 big blinds at a single table of limit hold'em, playing over a 48-hour period on and off. So it was not a 48-hour session. It was a on and off session at a single table of limit hold'em over 48 hours where I supposedly won over 1,500 big blinds. Again, this is limit hold'em. True or false? Yeah. True? Uh, am I allowed to comment if I know that you've told me that story before? And say that? Not yet. I mean, I kind of just did. Okay, well, anyhow, I'm going to say true. Okay, true. Moving on to the third question. In 2006, a would-be mugger followed Druff to his car after a poker session, but security was close behind because this person was previously arrested for past muggings, and he was stopped before he reached Druff. True or false? Jesus Christ, where should come up with this? Um, I mean, it's just that that sounds like something that would happen. You've never heard of it. Um, I'm going to have to say true again. Okay. Now remember, the one hint is that one of these is false. So one of the, according to, you'll have to pick one of these next false. Okay. Number four. Druff presently weighs 100 pounds more than when he stopped growing at the age of 18 and a half. And I will give one little detail here to make it a little easier. I don't mean exactly 100 pounds. 100 or more pounds above when I stopped growing at the age of 18 and a half. So take whatever weight I was when I stopped growing height-wise. To be honest, I've seen you lately. I've seen what you've been eating lately. You've split some dessert lately. I gotta go with you on that one too. Okay, well you may have to pick false on the last one here. Number five. By Jewish law, Druff's son Benjamin is considered Jewish. Okay, I'm gonna go f- I know that's false. False. Okay, well so just for the record now, I if I could go back in time, if I had a time machine, I think I would change one to false too. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say it for sure the last one's false. And now I'm kinda split, but I think my gut's telling me the first one's false too, and then the two, three, and four are true. Okay. So here we go. But you're stuck with the answers. Well, it's definitely true. Okay. You're stuck with the questions yeah. and answers you've given. I so. went, well, you never said I can't go back and... Okay, all right. Okay. For it's, the record, I think one is false. Okay. So okay, true, false. true, 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 false is his answer. So the first one. The girl who took Druff's virginity in 1989 has poker tournament caches listed on Hand and Mob. Brandon is unhappy with his answer of true. He wants to change yeah. it to false, but I've no, deemed it a, a final answer. He said true. He stuck with true. Is true the correct answer? Yes, it's correct. You shouldn't have changed it. Oh, wow. That is I correct. You wouldn't let me. Yes. You wouldn't let me. Okay. So you get that correct. Yes. So not a lot There's to say. Probably no way in God's green earth you're going you're gonna to tell us her name. No, I'm not going to say her. Now, I will, I will tell everybody, in case you're wondering, maybe you're playing with her at the World mm-hmm. Series or at your local cash game. You're not. She's not in poker anymore. She hasn't been for some time. But I did find that she had Hendon Mob caches, and I'm not in contact with her. I haven't been in contact with her in decades. So how did I find this? Like, what would even ever make me think that she plays poker? Well, I happened to see that she had a mutual friendship with someone I know through poker that's on my Facebook, and I was shocked. So I thought, hmm, is she in poker? And sure enough, I found that she had some tournament caches on Hand and Mob and was in poker at some point. We, of course, uh, did not ever run into each other. I haven't seen her since the early 90s. I don't know if she is aware of my prominence in poker, of what prominence exists, and I don't know if she would recognize me if she wasn't aware of that. If she was aware, then she'd see what I look like today. But if she only remembers Maybe me... Maybe you guys had a bad breakup, even if you don't think you did, and she's making now creating face, fake cash app and Venmo accounts. In <laughs> yes, that would as be... A, that, that's aggressive way to get back at you. That would be a good way to tie this segment into the previous one that we had early in the show. Well, that, before you get to number two, let's ask you this. You know, the, you can answer this one. The caches that, that you found on Hand and Mob, are they like bigger buy-in, like WPT, WSOP, you know, whatever, even if they're mini circuit events, or are they more like the whatever casino nightly no no it was smaller caches it was she was never a like the small whatever local casino nightly tournament. yeah it's kind of well not better than that but it was not uh, the world series or anything that was a major tournament it was above I mean, nightly's but it was like, I mean, were these like min caches like kessler caches yes yeah, kind of like kessler caches yeah she, she was not a That's success right. in, the, in the world of poker but she did play during the poker boom and uh racked up some caches so that was an interesting find 
but I, I didn't message her, and we, we've had no contact. I only switched it to false because I thought everything else was true except for the last one. Yeah. It made sense, but okay. Next okay. Question. Number two. Druff won over 1,500 big blinds at a single table of Limit Hold'em playing on and off over a 48-hour period. You said true. You accidentally gave away that I told you that story before, so of course everybody knows it is yeah, true. And yes, you're right. It is true. So you're two for two. Well, I didn't know if I'm allowed to say that because what difference I mean. It's, oh, yeah, but I guess that gives it away. You're right. Okay. My bad. This occurred in Cake Poker in 2007 where I won $76,000 over a weekend in a single table of 5,100 limit hold'em. And the loser of most of that money, who was a guy who had won some sort of like sweepstakes on there to give him like a 75K bankroll, which he chunked it all off that weekend. So not only was he terrible, but I also ran really well. There were uh, other pros in the game who were, who were in there on and off who just weren't running well, and I was winning all the money. So I ended up winning 76 k over that time period, something I knew I would never beat big blind wise, that there's just no way I'll ever win 1500 blinds again on and off over a 48 hour period at a single table. But I did. I won 1520 big blinds, which in limit hold them really hard to do. Now, funny, funny little aside in 2007, same year describing, a former associate of ours by the name of Dustin Wolf got ensnared in a major poker scandal at the time with poker stars for, uh, I guess it's multi-accounting, but when, you know, I always want to, when I say it, let people know when I, you know, instances like this, multi-accounting back then was also considered just having more than one account, not necessarily playing at the same time, but just having like an anonymous account that people didn't know he was. So anyhow, Dustin was doing that on poker stars. And then they started investigating. And then what they did, because Dustin was pretty popular and Pete had a lot of friends. So they started arbitrarily suspending anyone and everyone that had played at Dustin's IP address at his house in Santa Monica. And that literally, okay, I don't know if you remember this, but that literally shut down the high stakes limit of holding po- on poker stars for like three weeks. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Everyone's account was locked until... And my mind was included because I, although I didn't play like, you know, the 500, 1,000 or 1,000, 2,000 on there, you know, I had played at Dustin's house, like, you know, 50, 100, 100, 200. And everyone individually, myself included, had to call a, uh, can't remember his name, but someone that was like the head of security at Poker Stars and basically have like a talk to. Like imagine a world in poker where like that, that was like, you know, like nowadays, like you'd never hear of something like that, but everyone had to call him personally. And he like kind of would like admonish you and say, okay. You know, it's not the end of the world what you did, but you have to promise me, you know, you're not going to do it again. If you do, we are going to ban you. So everyone had to do that. All these accounts were shut down for two or three weeks. So what were people going to do? They weren't going to not gamble. And I don't remember how it came to be. I think Dustin may may have even started it, but everyone jumped over to cake poker when that happened during the suspension. Mm. In fact, Dustin later on. I don't know if you remember, this ended up getting suspended for like a year from Poker Stars. In fact, at first it was a lifetime suspension, and then they revoked, they changed it to a year because he violated that, that he made the guy the promise. And he, he went, yeah, he, he did it wrong. again. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. And then, then Dustin totally played on cake poker for like a year. Like that was where he was night and day. But anyhow, everyone jump ship because you know they had to gamble you know they weren't gonna not play for two weeks and everyone because i remember not even hearing cake poker what's cake poker then all of a sudden everyone was talking about it everyone was on there so i don't know i wonder if that coincided with the action on there that led to your victory or your big uh however 1500 big 1500 big blind yeah i I don't know if it was because there weren't that many people in the game so this probably happened before Dustin and all of them came over. I don't remember which month it was, but uh, there were not many others in the game, and it was always shorthanded, often very shorthanded. It was never heads up, but it was always like three-handed or four-handed, never more than that. And what was most notable of this, aside from the money itself and the big win compared to the limits I was playing, was the fact that I got suspended for it because the loser complained and he actually said and this is really what he said that there is a jewish conspiracy that jews were in the game to collude against him and we did and took his money (laughs) and 
it's crazy. You would think they'd dismiss him as a crackpot, but they actually were idiotic enough to believe this because I was trolling him in the chat because every time he was losing to me, he started making more and more anti-Semitic comments. And he didn't know who I was. I wasn't playing as Dan Druff. So he didn't know who he was playing against. But he hated Jews so much that he always kept talking about, oh, the Jews this, the Jews that. Oh, I know, I know you Jews are, are colluding against me. And there was no collusion at all. The guy was just a mega fish. But he wasn't getting that. He wasn't understanding that we were playing the way we were because he was a fish and we wanted to be in hands against him and that we basically knew that the good players in the game, that we knew their styles and you know we, we would drop out of the hand if, if, uh, if, if one of us seemed to be uh, raising a lot. But, but then it was challenging too because you know, you'd have the other good players trying to force me out. So I'd have to stay there sometimes with mediocre holdings. So it's not even like one of us would always fold and leave the other with him. But it was true because this idiot played every hand that, you know, it, it would end up heads up pots a lot were a lot more than, than me and the other good players in there. That's just the way it works if you play 100% of the hands dealt to you like, like this moron was and, and trying to stupidly bluff when it's not going to work. So anyway, when he started complaining the Jews this, the Jews that, I started to try to rile him up further and started typing things like uh, Israel power and uh, this this pot is going to the Anti-Defamation League. And I just kept writing all this Jew stuff to him to get him angry. And then one of the other guys was doing it too. And that's what really convinced him that this really was a Jewish conspiracy to collude against him. So they actually suspended me over this. And they told me that it's an irreversible decision and they're just keeping my money. I had already cashed out about 30K of it, probably more than 30K, because I had 46K left on the site when they suspended me. It was probably like a week later. But I had 46K trapped there. I thought I was never going to see it. But then somehow they just abruptly reversed their decision and wouldn't say why, probably because they realized how stupid they were. And they reopened my account. So that was very unnerving, though, to have my account frozen for a, a Jewish conspiracy, literally a Jewish conspiracy. Moving on, number three. In 2006, a would-be mugger followed Druff to his car after a poker session, but security was close behind because this person was previously arrested for past muggings, and he was stopped before he reached Druff. Brandon said it was true, and he reasoned that it's while he hasn't heard this story before, this sounds like something that could have easily happened. So, was he correct? No. It's completely made it up. There's nothing that ever happened like this to me. Maybe a mugger followed me at some point, but he never got to me, and nor did I hear about security ever getting to him. I just completely made this up for this segment. Number four. The first one Brandon got wrong, so he's two and one so far. Druff presently weighs 100 or more pounds above than when he stopped growing at the age of 18 and a half. Now, it is true when I stopped growing at 18 and a half, which is just as I was beginning college, so I actually was uh, growing entirely throughout high school. I never stopped growing in high school. And just when I started college at 18 and a half, I finally stopped growing. And I was very th- skinny back then. In fact, I wanted to gain weight. It bothered me that I was too skinny. I thought it would uh, affect me dating-wise. I, I would try to uh, gain weight, but I, it just couldn't do it. Now, obviously, I don't have that problem today. Now, it's the opposite where I want to lose weight. But am I really 100 pounds heavier at the same height as I was 33 years ago? Well, this was a bit of a trick question. I was asking 100 pounds or more. And the answer is that I am not 100 pounds or more above that weight. What am I? About 95 pounds above. So it's close. That, that was oh, the one I was talking on. about. That's the one I was talking about. Was uh, I said 100 or more. Yeah, that was close. All right. Well, if I said like 150, it would be obvious I wasn't 150 above it. If I said 50, you'd know I was for sure. So 100 is kind of hard to tell. It's kind of depressing, though, to think about it. Like I'm, this, I'm almost 100 pounds heavier than I was at the same height at a different point in my life. Now, I don't want to get back to that weight. In fact, being that weight again would be unhealthy for me at this point because you know, I'm not 18 and a half anymore, so I shouldn't be that weight. I was already skinny back then, but now I, that, that would be very unhealthy for me to get back down to that weight, but it would be impossible for me to get to that weight unless I had like cancer or something. Okay, by number five. This is the one false that Brandon gave. He is uh, currently two and two, though he thinks that number four was kind of cheap and he should be three and one. 
Number five, by Jewish law, Druff's son Benjamin is considered Jewish. And Brandon said he knows this is... I know that. I know. Out of every single one other than the one you told me, I know. I mean, I know this is equal. High confidence. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely false. High confidence. So, is Brandon correct? Is it false? No, it's true. You got it wrong. Wait, I thought it was based on your mother. It is, so let me explain. So, as you guys know, I am a full Jew. And what about Benjamin's mom? Is she a Jew? Answer, no. So that should answer it right there. That's why Brandon is convinced that uh, by by, uh, Jewish law that Benjamin would not be Jewish. But hold on a second. As Brandon says, Jewish law states that you are Jewish if you have Judaism through your mother's line. It's matrilineal, which means your mother, your mother's mother, her mother's mother. If it goes up and everybody was Jewish, then you're Jewish. Or I should say it goes down from there. So let me give you an example. If a woman is Jewish and then she has a child with a man who's not Jewish, the kid is still considered Jewish. And let's say the kid is female. So it's now a Jewish female by Jewish law then any kid that she has will automatically be Jewish, regardless of what the man is. And if it's another girl, then any child that she has will be Jewish, regardless of what the man is. So actually, me being Jewish doesn't even matter for this exercise. It matters by Jewish blood, because uh, this way, uh, no matter how little Jewish that Benjamin would be from that matrilineal line, that you'd still have it counteracted by me being full Jewish, but as far as Jewish law, it doesn't even take that into consideration. So, Benjamin's mom's grandmother was Jewish. Now, her mom, who was born to that grandmother, was not raised Jewish. I don't know the full story of why not, but she's not. So, she's not Jewish. I know that her grandfather was not Jewish, so maybe that's why. But the, the mom was not raised Jewish, so the mom doesn't really consider herself Jewish or has ever practiced Judaism. And then Benjamin's mom, same thing. She was not raised Jewish and does not consider herself Jewish and has never considered herself Jewish. But by Jewish law, because of having the Jewish grandmother, Benjamin's mom, therefore, is technically Jewish, which makes Benjamin technically Jewish. And even if you just want to go by percentage of Jewish blood, it would be more than 50% because of me being 100. So there you go. So Benjamin is actually... Five-eighth Jewish by blood, and is Jewish by Jewish law. I guess you could say it's a technicality, but you knew the thing about the matrilineal. I guess I just never told you this part of it. Yeah, the whole exercise sounds like a exercise of loopholes to me. No, I, no. Okay, well, I, I think you just ninety-five pounds and nine, seven, that, that you know that's the only one I take objection. The other, the other four, fine. The other one, that's a, that's ridiculous. Like you don't. Know, that's like asking. I mean, I don't know. That's just too. You said you're 95 and not 100. Yeah, that's a loophole. But I've I, I've that's never been 100 though. Silly. I'll say this too. I've never actually been 100 over that weight, which is good and bad. It's good that I've never been that much. It's bad that means I'm like at my highest weight I've ever been. So that that's the downside. But the the upside is I've never been that high. Concerned earlier. You said you're concerned earlier about people calling and complaining. That'd be my one complaint about that question. Okay, That's well, just silly. We'll see. We'll see if the audience complains. The other four are good. Yep. Okay. You really got me with the mugging thing. So I figured somebody really had, did that or would have done that to you if they hadn't been stopped. And then the uh, girlfriend with the poker. Yeah, yeah, I talked my way out of that because I was so sure that five was false. <laughs> but five is true. So. Wait. So how many were how many were false? The mugging. So, so yeah. So it it turned out that there were. Um, only two false, the mugging and the weight thing. And er- everything else is true. So I went two and three. I didn't do very yeah, good. Yeah, you didn't do very well. And I tried to switch one from, from true to Yeah, false. you almost I went one and four. I one and four. Wow. Jesus. <laughs> this, is, this is why uh, who wants to be a millionaire takes a final answer. Okay, so now that we've done this little lighthearted diversion, we will move on to something a little more serious. I want to talk about uh, Sean Shikan being sentenced. Is that something you want to talk about, or you want to move to something else? Well, yeah, no, I've uh, I've followed it from the start. From okay. The you want to start a couple of years ago. Okay, then we'll talk about the it. pandemic, so sure, go, go for it. I know all about it. Okay, so Sean Shikan is kind of a controversial person, though most really don't think that much of him 
now because he just isn't prominent in poker anymore. I know he still plays, but he was a prominent... Well, he had his first after uh, he pled guilty. Literally, this is a weird thing. After he pled guilty, that next week, he played in his first WSOP tournament in years. At least that's funny enough. Uh, your little girl, Haley, uh, what is her name? The Hans? one you give a ride? No, not the one. The pretty girl, right? Which one writes the article? The pretty girl, the, the guy's wife? Haley something? Haley Mills? I, I don't know what you're talking about. H- Haley Hintz is the writer. Who's the Haley? Who's the, the hot girl, the hot Haley? The other young Haley? The, the young Haley oh, is Haley Hanna. And but she doesn't. Haley she, Hanna. That's the one that you gave a ride to. No, never gave her a ride. I've never met her. Didn't you give a Haley? Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Anyhow, I'm getting the Haley. Haley is confused. But anyhow, so Haley had reported in her writings that he had not played in the WSOP tournament in like 10 years. And it was strange because right after he pled guilty to the, these federal charges that you're going to talk about, he played in his first World Series tournament in, like I said, 10 years, and he ended up cashing. Anyhow, that was his first cash in, like, eight years, nine years, anywhere. So the point I'm making, yeah, he hasn't really been in, you know, consistent in poker participant for all these years. He's kind of been out of poker for a while. Yeah. You know, he's not even relevant. I mean, I'm not saying he's not relevant. Anyhow, he was, he, you know, better, but the best way to put it is he was a name that got a ton of notoriety because of a... Uh, issue, blow-up, fight that got a lot of airplay on ESPN in the 2004, I believe, main event where both he and Mike Madison went deep. In fact, I think Chacon was knocked out maybe 11th or 12th, uh, whereas I think Madison got knocked out 10th. But whatever it was, there was a ton of back and forth. You could even go to like, you know, YouTube or whatever and just type in Madison versus Shiki or that was, that's his nickname, or and you could see this. Um, and then he played like on high stakes poker for a couple years and kind of was somewhat like during the TV era of poker, like would show up here or there, like a post, like a full tilt this or poker stars that, but then he just flat off just was gone. So if you're not from, you know, like that pr- prior pre poker boom or during the poker boom generation, likely you've never even heard of him. And a lot of people listening, I'm either that haven't been around for 20 years now, they're not going to know who he even is. Yeah, right. and yes, and uh, you, you were close though. He was in the '05 main event with Mattisau when they had that big blow up, okay. and I actually played it and commented on it when we first covered this most recent situation with him facing the federal charges. But we're not going to do that again because we did that last time. So anyway, he pled guilty as Brandon mentioned in 2020. Well, hold on, the one thing. Hold on, hold on. It's interesting you said that because this is the one thing I don't understand. How are people of any kind of degree, like what, how are people, you know, from my understanding, from what I've read, he was operating an unlicensed cannabis shop. So it's not like he's selling weed to like people under, you know, on the lowdown or whatever. Like they had a store. I saw a picture of it. You know, there was a bust and a raid. They had a business. They had security guards with guns. In fact, part of the reason why they gave him jail time uh, instead of any probation is because after they raided the place and they, they took guns and they took marijuana, they replenished the guns and the marijuana. And the guns part really pissed off both the state of California and the judge. You know, meaning like they did a raid. Well, I, I think you're answering your own question here, but you, you got to let me explain to everybody what's going on here. But, but, right? No, right, right. But, but what, I, okay, what I want to understand is how can you just open up an unlicensed, on un- anything store and sell marijuana? Like there had to be some loophole where they thought what they were doing was legal I mean, because that's just like a ticking time bomb. That's my question. Like, how can you... That'd be like me and you. Hey, Struff, let's open up a, a marijuana store. We don't get any licensing. We don't do anything. We just start selling weed to any, anyone that comes in our store. How can anyone do that? Well, I don't know. That, that, that That's... And that's what he that, did. That, I know. That's been the mystery here, wh- why he did it this way. But he may have just felt, well, you know, it's, it's legal here. No one's going to clamp down on it. So he, he just kind of skipped the licensing part, figuring it's not a big deal. I mean, there were a lot of dumb things that were done along these lines. So on April 7th, 2021, authorities executed a search warrant at a uh, 3,400 square foot business that was in Spring Valley, not Las Vegas, Spring Valley, but Spring Valley, California, which is near San Diego. And more than 3,000 pounds of marijuana were seized and five guns were taken. And then, and yes, a street value of six million dollars. Yeah, and then right? yes, and then 
as Brandon mentioned, after that they got replacement guns, and that uh, made things even worse. It was alleged that from 2019 through early 2022, which of course was substantially later than the raid on April 7th, 2021, so they continued operating, that they ran this illegal marijuana business called Canaland, you know, referring to cannabis, and it was... Real, real cute, huh? Isn't that cute? Yeah, Canaland. Real cute. It's like the old game Candyland. Do you remember that? Do you remember the board game Candyland? Of course, yeah. I played yeah. it. I loved it. I, loved I know. Games. I loved, as a kid, Candyland and Shoots and Ladders. Yes, right? yes. I played a lot of that, too. You know, you know what I hated on Shoots and Ladders was there was this one really, really, really long slide that goes from like 81 to 19. You, you just... It was a killer. It was so demoralizing because you'd be crushing everybody, and then you'd land on that one wrong spot, and it would drop you all the way down, like to near the very beginning. Oh, that, I remember. Yeah, I remember there was a commercial where they show like a dad losing and going all the way down, and the kids <laughs> would laugh at him, like in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. People don't even know what that game is now. Yep, that's true. So, yeah, they do. On uh, if you ask Ben about Candy Lantern or, or Shoots and Ladders, he'd have no idea. You know, we, we played Candyland with him a little bit, but I bet he doesn't remember at this point. If, if only I were uh, with him right now and it wasn't 3 in the morning, I would ask him, but I'm in a secret location and he's not with me and it's 3 in the morning. So, anyway, on June 6th of 2022, Shikan entered a guilty plea for a conspiracy to distribute marijuana, and he admitted that until February 24th, 2022... He knowingly and intentionally conspired to distribute 100 kilograms and more of a mixture of a substance containing a detectable amount of marijuana, and that violated uh, United States Code Sections 841C and 846. Mm -hmm. He he also willingly forfeited about $300,000 in cash, but the funny thing was, uh, it actually wasn't real cash. It was the casino. Yeah, it it was, yes, he forfeited casino chips. (laughs) I wonder how that even works. Like, does the government send somebody into the Bellagio or the Aria to try to, like, redeem them? Probably. With that? Probably. That's probably exactly what they did. Is now, go to- so this is, what I'm, this is what I'm trying to say here. Every, like, five years, you hear about some uber-rich celebrity who someone gave them some kind of accounting and tax advice where they believe that there's some code where you don't have to pay taxes. Remember Wesley Snipes? Yeah, Wesley Snipes. Was the, he was the best known one for that. And they always go to right. They always go to prison. Okay, how can he open up a marijuana shop without any license? Get raided, have the guns, the money, the weed taken, and then just go back right in the face of all that and do it again. Like that doesn't even like. I get what you're saying. Bad choices. Those aren't bad choices. I'm thinking that somebody gave him horrible advice. Like that, it's legal. If there's a loophole, it just doesn't make sense. There, there may have been something like he may have been tricked into believing that this is just a, a licensure thing, and he's going to get a fine, and he, he wasn't worried about it. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. Because like, then you open up it again after you've been raided. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's, it's you, that's what I'm trying to say. It just it doesn't make sense. Like we're not hearing the full story about something. Yeah, like, and he doesn't like who would do that. Like who would you know what logical? And he's you know to give a backstory to people. He's allegedly still a business owner in, in Nevada. Like, he owns a bunch of tattoo parlors, all, or he used to, and it says in the article that already still does, tobacco shops, vape stores, um, all over Nevada. So, you know, he, he knows how to run a business, has experience in businesses, so it, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And he was trying to get probation. That's what the goal was. He and his attorney were trying to ask for uh, probation, but the judge said no and sentenced him for four years, which is exactly what the prosecutors were asking for. The crazy thing is, that's the light end of the sentence. Under the statute, I read he was looking at up to 40 years. Yes. I knew he wouldn't get anything like that, but... uh, yeah, especially because he came back and just reopened it and brought the guns back. <laughs> Got replacement guns. That's what, right. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. If you would have just pled guilty, why would you do it a second time? It just doesn't make sense. That's what I'm thinking. Someone told him, like maybe what you said. You just need to get a license. They'll find you. 
Like it, it nothing makes it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't. I, I wonder that, do that. I wonder that too when that happened. Like who would do that again? Like especially the second time. Like I don't know. Weird. Yeah. So you definitely won't I see him. Sympathy. No sympathy for him. I mean, there's no no sympathy. Yeah. No, for sure. Like who does that? Like, that's just, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like to have you know what I mean? And the thing is, they they showed it. And maybe you see on the article you're reading. It was a big ass like building. It was. Yes, I saw that. Like a big. <laughs> yeah. Just doesn't make any sense. So he has until January first to surrender. Uh, I guess really, there's no. You know, some people always surrender early just to get it done, but. You know, with the holidays coming up, I don't really even see a purpose. He's going to be gone for four years anyhow. Federal prison time, like with SBF, it's like 95%. There's really no, you know, the 97. So he won't be getting out till, uh like, late 2027 or 28. Yeah. He'll be, like, close to 60 by then. And then he'll have a three years of supervised release after that, too. And there was some girl that was involved with him. He had a business partner. I don't know if she got the same sentence, but when they were initially were arrested and charged, there was a female co-conspirator with him. Not a poker player, but I don't know what happened to her. Yeah, I don't know Obviously, either. they're not going to report on that. <laughs> well, okay. Well, then let's move on. Not much more to say about that. Let's move on. Do you feel any, do you feel any sympathy towards no, him? No, I, I don't. Would you feel bad for him? Any? Of course not. Like, no, no. I mean, he, he, no, he did this to himself here. And he's lucky. I mean, you know, they could have given him worse for doing it twice. You know what I mean? Yeah. It kind of got off easy, I think. Yeah, that's that's I mean, incredibly you know. moronic to do when, they, when they've already raided you. That you, you know when they're raiding you that there's a problem, especially the feds. The feds don't do this stuff unless they really think they have a strong case. And then what do you do again? You just reopen it and get it's, more guns. Yeah. yeah. Does that take my guns? Well, I guess I can buy more guns. You know, you know what would be ironic? I'm just going to say this. Hold on. Because they're both nonviolent type crimes. Technically, Sean Sharkhan could, somewhere along the federal prison system, run into our friend, Mr. Uh, Bankman Freed. Oh, that's true. Could. I mean, he could, he could. I think they would probably both be in the same level of federal prisons. You know what I mean? Like, neither of them are going to go to Marion in, in Illinois. You know, any of the maximum where the violent, you know, the serial killers and just the worst of the worst are. They're going to be in low, you know, criminal offender type facilities you know like basically like what do they call it like club fed fed club fed yeah club fed yeah what's the term yeah Yeah, club fed yeah maybe they will meet and then sean jacan can bring him into poker maybe we'll see sam brankman freed in the uh 2065 world series the 2065 yeah that's funny that's funny well you know what if if you're right i mean he could be in, in there as easily as like 2040 if I'm right, he may be. He may his first event may be the super seniors. Yeah, <laughs> super seniors. That's funny. All right, all right, fair enough. Okay, now it's time to move on to a segment that I know Brandon's been waiting for, and some of you have been waiting for. It's something we do every so often on this show. Mojave Desert and Las Vegas history. This is Mojave Desert and Las Vegas history, and this is a special edition in a way because it's also about a current event that also has Mojave Desert history and some Las Vegas history. So we do this segment every so often and talk about various things in these regions that have happened over the years that sometimes has some kind of later impact on Las Vegas and sometimes doesn't, but just... I find interesting and tell you guys about. So this segment is about someone who just passed away recently, and that would be Uh. Don Laughlin. So Don Laughlin was not a young man. As you might guess from the name, if you're not familiar with who he is, he is basically the founder of the town of Laughlin. It is named after him. He died on October 22nd of this year, so... About two weeks ago. He was 92 years old, born in 1931 in Minnesota. And while I was looking into him, and I know Brandon says he knows uh, a lot about Mr. Laughlin as well, I learned some new things that I wasn't aware of, both about him and about uh, Laughlin itself and how it came to be. 
Laughlin, and I'm talking about Don Laughlin when I said Laughlin, he was actually in Vegas in the 50s and had a casino in Vegas. Did you know about this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it was called the 101 Club. And this is in the late 50s he purchased this. And he sold it in 1964. So for the moment, he was out of the casino business. He was fairly young at that point. He was 33 years old. And you know, think about today, how many 33-year-olds are not only buying casinos, but selling them. He's, he sold a casino after owning it for you know, probably about six years or so. So I'm not sure exactly where he uh, got the money. I know he worked as a fur trapper originally in Minnesota. This is before the casino that he owned and before moving to Vegas. And that he used those profits from being a fur trapper to buy slot machines. But I, I don't know how he accumulated enough money to buy... 101 club in his 20s even if casinos were much much cheaper to buy back then and even though it was probably a pretty small casino i don't know much about the 101 club do you no I don't. i'm looking at his wikipedia now it says that he took money that he made from fur trapping and started putting illegal slot machines in hunting lodges but then it also says he was making 500 dollars a week then and his principal so he was putting him in hunting lodges when he was in high school and his high school principal gave him an ultimatum, either get out of the slot world or get out of school. He decided to drop out of school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't quite understand this, but somehow he came up with enough money to buy this casino in uh, the late 50s, in his uh, late 20s. It was his age at the time. So he was in a private plane. I don't know if he was a pilot and could fly it himself or if it's just a plane he owned and someone he else was. was a pilot. Oh, he was. Oh, he was big into aviation. He was big into aviation. Okay. Yeah, he was a pilot. Okay. 100%. So he's flying his private plane, and he it was near the Colorado River, and he became convinced just from looking down from the air that he felt that there was big potential for a major resort area near the Colorado River a little bit south of the Davis Dam. Now, the Davis Dam is the reason that there are no boat trips down the Colorado River from where Hoover Dam is, which is near Las Vegas, to Laughlin. Otherwise, you could boat all the way through. And there probably would be boat trips that would take you between the two. It might even be fun to do such a thing. But you can't because there is a dam in the middle. The other thing that's interesting for those that aren't familiar, A, Laughlin is about a little over an hour away, but... From a ge geographical standpoint, it's called the tri-state area because it intersects with obviously the state of Nevada, Laughlin, uh, Kingman, Arizona. I'm not Kingman, Bullhead, Arizona, and Needles, California. Yeah, all three states literally intersect in like a tri like a triangular point. Like you could literally be in three different states within five minutes. Yes, and, so and that's kind of interesting. That's kind of a unique, uh, you know, unique thing. Well, and I actually looked into possibly doing an unofficial thing called three corners. You know, you've probably heard of four corners, where you can actually have one hand and one foot in four different states at the same time. It's actually uh, an Indian tribe that owns it and commercialized it and charges like twenty dollars to do it. But uh, that that's at the border of uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. There's an actual border that's uh, you know, a, a quadruple border right there. But that's the only place in the country where such a thing exists. But I thought, well, what about three corners? Because as Brandon says, they, they intersect those three states right at that point. However, I was unable to visit three corners because it is in the water. So that's the, I guess you can visit it on a boat. And there's no sign commemorating. It's, you got to kind of figure it out, I guess, with a GPS on your phone. It's a little aside there. But yes, it's referred to as the Tri-State Area. And the Davis Dam is north of it. The Davis Dam was completed in 1951. And that is south of Hoover Dam, down the Colorado River. And then south of that is present-day Laughlin. So at the time, there was no Laughlin at all, except Don Laughlin. And he's flying in his private plane. He's looking down, and he's seeing that 
the two cities of uh, Kingman, which is in Arizona, and Needles in California. He's seeing that uh, these exist, and he could see they're growing. And he's like, oh, there's a river right here, and these areas are growing because people who came to work on the Davis Dam took up residence here. So now the area is growing. That just spurred growth here. So even though the Davis Dam is done, it's been done for 13 years, now the area keeps growing. So right then is when he decided that he wants to start a resort town right there. It was because of that one flight where he just looked down and saw those towns growing and saw the Colorado River and said, ah, this is a perfect place to have a resort town. So he went and bought a closed motel that is presently where Laughlin is. And in fact, that resort still exists, even though it's in a different form now. But it was, it's called the uh, Riverside Resort. It wasn't called that when he bought it, but that's what he named it. Actually, it's actually called Don Laughlin's Riverside. Yes. That's the actual full name. Yes. and he, I've stayed there many times. Now, now, you didn't stay at the initial building because this is a eight-room no. riverfront motel. He bought this for uh, $250,000 back then, which is you know, good money back then in the 60s. And what's interesting is they apparently his offer for this motel was not the only one. And I don't know who bid the highest for it, but the reason it was sold to Don Laughlin is because he had a previous casino background and he talked about wanting you know, to make this into a casino and the former owner liked that. He liked the idea of this becoming something. So he thought that Laughlin had the best chance to make it successful. So then he uh, quickly tried to grow the Riverside Resort to become something bigger. The Riverside Resort was the only thing over there. So there was no town around it like there is today in Laughlin. And how did it become known as Laughlin? Well, you'd say, well, just because that was his name, of course they named it after him. Well, that's not true. Uh, The U.S. Postal Service came to him and said, look, this area is becoming prominent enough to where it needs to have a post office to receive mail. So it needs to be addressed to some city. So you need to give the area a name. So he wanted the town to be called Riverside Casino. (laughs) And the postal inspector said, no, that sounds ridiculous. So the postal inspector said, well, you know, your last name is Laughlin. Why don't you just call it Laughlin? And he said, yeah, that's a better idea. So that's why it's called Laughlin, because the postal inspector suggested that. So that's why it's not called Riverside Casino, Nevada. Don Laughlin's Riverside Hotel and Casino expanded greatly during the year that I was born, which is 1972. So that's that's a pretty old place. It's 51 years old. And that is the property where Brandon has stayed. So they added a lot of square footage to it. By well, the, the end of 72, they had uh, 56 rooms. And three years later, in 1975, they added 52 more to be 108 rooms at that point. And then they added another 253 rooms in 1983. And then 307 more rooms in 1986 to become a fairly large place. You were going to say something? You were talking about how the post office or the, the post or postal inspector said Don Laughlin's casino is a ridiculous name. There is an actual city in Nevada on the border with Idaho called Jackpot, Nevada. So, I mean, I'm just saying. Well, that's a better name than Riverside you Casino, familiar? though. Riverside oh, Casino is kind of awkward. Yeah, I but Are you I, familiar I, with Jackpot, Nevada? Yes, yes. Have you ever been there? No, but I'm aware it exists. Okay, I've never been there either. Yeah, I, I'm aware of most of these town names in Nevada and where they are. I just uh, haven't been to a lot of them. In 1987, there was talk about making it easier to go between the city across the river, which is Bullhead City in Arizona, to make it easier to get to Laughlin without having to uh, go a good deal around to get to the nearest bridge. So Laughlin thought this was a good idea, especially because 
a lot of the employees that work in Laughlin, even back then, lived in the nearby towns like Bullhead, Kingman, Needles. So the ones that lived in Bullhead, this would make it way easier for them to get to work. And Laughlin actually, I'm talking about Don Laughlin, that's the city. Don Laughlin funded a bridge over the Colorado River that connected Bullhead and Laughlin. So it still remains to this date the only easy way to go between Bullhead City and Laughlin. And they actually are building a second bridge right now. So soon that won't be the only easy way between the two. But that was a big deal in 87, and he was uh, largely funding this. So he really was pro that bridge being built and thought it would be easier for people not only to work at his casino, but also to visit it from Bullhead, which is, was a much bigger area than, than Laughlin was and, and still is to this day. In present day, I don't know what it was like in 1987, but in present day, Bullhead is the home to most of Laughlin's employees. So people who work in the Laughlin casinos typically do not live in Nevada, which is kind of weird, but they live in Arizona. There are some who live in California in the Needles area, but Needles is pretty small. And there's some that live in Kingman, which is a little further away. That's in Arizona. But most of them live in Bullhead because it's, it's a quick drive across the river. He still owned the Riverside Casino at the time of his death. Even though he's in his 90s, he didn't decide to exit that whole industry. He, he stayed with it till his dying day. He had pictured Laughlin to become basically Vegas by the river. He did not really think of it as what it became. Because it's not really a resort town. I mean, yes, it's by the Colorado River, but the draw to Laughlin these days is not so much the river. I mean, they have certain events on the river where people will come for that, but it's really evolved to be like a small working class casino town that appeals to those who don't really like the expense or the crowds of Vegas. People who want kind of like a low-key Vegas that's, that's who goes to Laughlin. It's a, a lot of working class people, a lot of people who find the strip to be expensive or pretentious and they just or, or too busy. They just want a kind of a more laid back environment. So that's really who comes to Laughlin. It's not seen as a place you go there for recreation or, or because you're going to resorts. It's, it's not like that. Now, it's, it's grown a lot. There's a lot more properties there. Uh, of course, Harris being one of them. That's the Caesars property in the area. But there's a number of other casinos there. So if you drive to Laughlin from Vegas and you're, you're going down Route 95, you're, you're going to have mostly nothingness once you leave the greater Vegas area. And I think it's like 95 miles away on Route 95. It's something like 95 miles away. And you can go pretty fast. I think the speed limit's actually 75 on that road. And there's never any traffic. So you get down to Laughlin, and then you got to get off the freeway and, and drive a little bit off the freeway. So you, it doesn't just drop you right in Laughlin like, like the 15 does for Vegas. But then you, know, you go down Surface Street for a little bit, and then you're there in Laughlin, and you see like a, a strip, like one street with all the casinos. Really, like all the casinos are on one street. So the town really has no depth to it. Then off to the side, there's small residential areas, but the, the population of Laughlin is pretty small, even to this day. So really, the employees are uh, mostly from Arizona. So presently, the city of Laughlin has 8,000 people. Bullhead City has 42,000. Fort Mojave has 16,000. And Needles has 5,000. So as you might guess, Bullhead is what feeds a lot of what goes on in Laughlin, even though it's in a different state. I don't know how the state income tax situation works. I don't know if you work in Nevada, which doesn't have a state income tax, but live in Arizona, which does, do you have to pay income tax on that salary? I'm not sure. I would think yes, but possibly no. So I guess uh, someone who knows about the tax law there could tell me, but I, I don't know the answer, but that's a pretty unusual situation in the West where someone lives in one state and works in another. I know in the East it's very common because the a lot of the states in the Northeast are very small geographically, and even ones that aren't small geographically 
will often have big cities right on the border between two states. So New York City is the best known one. New York City has a lot of people that work in Manhattan that live in New Jersey. It's very, very common. And a lot of New Jersey cities that are along the Hudson are considered the greater New York City area, even though they're in a different state of New Jersey. So in the East, this type of thing is very common, but in the West, you just don't see this. But this is one case where you do. But he was really not picturing it to be what it is there. He wasn't thinking, I'm going to create like a working class Vegas. That's not, that was not the goal. The goal was, I, I know, I don't think he believed it was going to become as big as Vegas, but of course Vegas wasn't that big in the 60s, so maybe that was the goal. But I know he was hoping it was going to be much bigger and kind of similar to Vegas, except it has a, a river and it's got a kind of a resort theme to it. So it, it kind of evolved into something different, but you know, he, it, it still was successful, obviously, and it's still a lot bigger than it was back when, when he first started, where it was just one small motel he bought, and then he you know, put some machines in there, and then eventually it grew and grew and grew, and, and then it had... Uh, I, I didn't add up all these numbers. I just told you the rooms. So, I mean, probably close to 1,000 rooms. And then a lot of the surrounding hotels popped up. So, now it, it is a real town and a real option for people to go to in Nevada to gamble if they want to gamble in southern Nevada and don't want to go to Vegas. I went to Laughlin eight and a half years ago. I did not go to Don Laughlin's place. In fact, I've never been there. But this is what I said about Laughlin. Actually, it wasn't. It was nine and a half years ago. I thought it was eight and a half years ago. It's actually uh, or ten and a half years ago. Hmm. I thought it was eight and a half years ago. But I, the time flies here. It was actually in uh, May 2013 when I went and then did a write-up. I've been there since then, but I, th- I did a write-up, which I went back and looked at from ten years ago. And it was funny because reading my own writing, I'd actually forgotten some of the stuff I wrote. So I was actually learning for myself, strangely enough. So I went to Harris Laughlin, and I'm not going to really comment about the Harris part of it because it's it's not important here. But I did notice some things well, there. Well, you know what? No, you you should comment briefly on it just so people that don't know, you know, have an idea. Okay, you know, I, I guess I will. Okay, you talk. Since you, we both have stayed there, we both can comment on it to give people perspective. Okay, they like hearing that. Stuff. Okay, okay. Who knows? Maybe somebody might want to visit it. Okay. And I want I want to add one more thing. I was part of. The reason why the majority of the employees live in Bullhead versus Laughlin is other than the resort corridor, there isn't much infrastructure, meaning housing. There isn't a ton of housing in Laughlin. The majority of housing that is in Laughlin are either manufactured homes or even more so RVs and mobile homes. Mm. And the majority of them are owned and used by, and there's, and then, you know, I think there's like two literally two apartment complexes in Laughlin. And both of those are senior, like, you know, 55 or older type communities. The majority of the people that live in the mobile homes and the RV parks in Laughlin are uh, snowbirds uh, or they have a second home somewhere else. Um, and, you know, you would think it's, you know, oh, you know, it's a poor town because you go in there, you know, it's lower limits, food's lower. But no, there are people literally that by choice live half the year in Laughlin. They just enjoy it because, you know, the funny thing is it's a Friday night in Laughlin and they have a, you know, like a strip. They literally have a strip like Vegas, but you can go from one end of the strip to the other in about five minutes. You know, there's never traffic. There's never like loud music. You know, it's, it, it, you know, you think about Las Vegas Boulevard, especially now with the race coming. And then you think of Laughlin strip and it's like night and day. You know, you literally can go to Harris, which is at one end of the strip versus Harris is the last, uh, casino on the strip it's i guess that would be the the northern part of it'd be the northern part of the strip whereas don laughlin uh riverside is literally the first casino when you enter laughlin when you get off the highway and you make a right onto i'm trying to think what is a drag called like the laughlin strip is it like it's something boulevard is it yeah i don't even know yeah i'm not sure it may be because you know yeah well anyhow laughlin is the first and then obviously as i said harris is the last um but the reason why the majority of people live in Bullhead is because there isn't housing. There, there just isn't housing in Laughlin. Um, so that's why. Uh, you know, that's why the majority of people have to live there, because there's nowhere for them to live. And it's such a small little commute over a bridge anyhow, it's irrelevant. You know, it really is. 
except for the fact that Arizona does have state taxes, correct? Yes, that's what I was saying. So, yeah, so that would be the only incentive, I would think, if all things were created equal, because Nevada doesn't. So, you know, but uh, I don't know. You know, that's a good question if there's some exemption or how that would even work. Um, but anyhow, yeah, go on. Talk about Harris for a few minutes because we both can give our okay. various varying degrees of perspective. And I was there as recently as about a year and a half ago. Okay, so, actually, no, less than that, about a year ago. So he, here, here's my uh, perspective from 10 years ago, which I'm referring to a write-up I did. So this way I don't have to try to remember things from a long time ago, you know, small things that made an impact on me. So first of all, I, I noticed that with blackjack that if you're a card counter, and this is 10 years ago, I don't know how it is now, that what they would do would be shuffle up on you if you abruptly increase your bet. So the dealers can tell in card counting, the basic concept is that when a lot of small cards come out, that it generally makes it more advantageous for the player because then there's a higher percentage of large cards, which gives the player more of an advantage. So that's the whole basics of card counting. And when the dealer sees they've just dealt a bunch of twos, three, fours, and fives, and then suddenly the player raises his bet a lot the next hand, it's pretty obvious what he's doing. And usually dealers, if not told to get involved, just won't say anything. But apparently in Laughlin, and I noticed this not only in 2013, I noticed this uh, well before that, that the way they handle it there is the dealers are just told to shuffle up, which means they just, instead of dealing the hand, will just reshuffle. So then if the count is good, meaning there's a lot of high cards left compared to low cards, that that's all erased because they reshuffle. Now, I have long maintained, without getting into a whole long discussion about this, but I've, I just want to say, I've long maintained this should be illegal because it's screwing the other players at the table. Because what it's basically doing is the second the deck goes into a positive EV state, whereas it was negative before, now it's temporarily in a positive EV state that everybody's benefiting from, not just the card counters, the, the others just don't realize it that you're robbing the players of this and basically this allows the casino to shuffle whenever the deck goes into a good state and claim it's the fault of the card counters who are raising their bets. So it just shouldn't be allowed to do this, but uh, that seems to be the way they usually handle it in Laughlin, as, at least as of 10 years ago, where uh, they're not so much banning you, they're just shuffling up on you the second they see this. So that I noticed. Harris was built in 1988, and that is where I stayed when I went 10 years ago. I said it hadn't aged well. It was uh, 25 years old at that point. I said that it looked like it was built in the 70s and renovated in a low-budget fashion about 10 years ago, even though it was built in 88. So I said that it didn't age well and kind of looked beat up. I don't know what it looks like now 10 years later than that. Here's something that I really didn't have much of a memory of, but it's an interesting little story. I said the elevator situation was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I stayed in Tower 3, and despite being served by six elevators, there was a perpetual line at the lobby to go up. And I said it was frustrating because if you just want to go down to the lobby quickly and you want to go back up quickly, you can't. You get stuck on this long line to go back up. And I, I mentioned it was Memorial Day weekend, so it was crowded. But I said that the elevator came very quickly when you called it from the floor where you stayed. But it seemed like there was a big backlog going up, but not down, and I couldn't explain it. But I saw that all weekend, and I, I couldn't figure out why it was so fast to go down, but so slow to go up. So I couldn't figure that one out. Then I, I mentioned this in the post, and I know I've mentioned this next thing before, that if you're looking to meet attractive single women in Laughlin, don't. You're never going to meet any. There are almost no women in Laughlin, at the casinos, who are young and single. You just don't see it. I'm not saying never, but it, it's very unusual. Whereas in Vegas, you see it all the time. But you don't have girl groups visiting Laughlin. So the only young women who visit Laughlin are usually going with their boyfriend or husband. So that's like one of the worst people, worst places to go to meet chicks, unless you want to meet old women. If you want to meet women who are like 70, you can meet plenty of singles at that age, but you're not going to find young women, or even, I think you probably won't even meet many women who are like 40 there who are single. I think it's going to either be like really old or not single is the choice there. So not, not a good place to meet chicks there. Though I, I will tell a story 
that uh, I, I told Brandon in text. I know he knows this story. It, it actually does involve a single girl. At least I think she was single in Laughlin. So I was at a blackjack table and I was counting cards at one place that wasn't shuffling up on me. This was uh, the old uh, Ramada Express, which I thought was like a Ramada Inn that was like supposed to be like a lower version of it, like kind of like the Holiday Inn Express, but it wasn't. It was actually a Ramada with a train theme to it. That's what the Express part was. And they actually had a little train that kind of went around the property, a little gimmicky train. But anyway, I was playing blackjack there and I was, I was counting cards and a girl came and sat next to me who was very pretty in her 20s. And I thought she just, you know, it was a girl just showing up to play. I didn't really think much of it. But she didn't really seem interested in playing. I don't even know if she played any hands, but she just kept talking to me. And I didn't get the vibes from her that she was a prostitute. And in fact, there was nothing at all sexual about the conversation. And she stayed there for quite some time, 20, 25 minutes. So I was really wondering what's going on here because she wasn't playing. She was alone. There was no one with her. No guy, no girl, just by herself. Just sitting here making conversation with me for a long time. Nothing sexual. And and uh, I totally did not get at all a vibe that this was a prostitute you know, waiting to spring it on me. You know, hey, you want to have some fun? They don't waste 25 minutes with you down there having conversation because they, they, they want to get it out pretty quickly. Like, hey, do you want to go party? you want to go have fun? And then, then they drop it on you that it costs money. So she didn't do that. Like 20, 25 minutes just talking to me about just random stuff. And she seemed to be enjoying the conversation. She seemed to be enjoying my company. So I was like, wow, okay, I can't believe it. I'm meeting someone in Laughlin. Cool. Now, again, there, there, there didn't seem to be any flirting. So I, I was kind of wondering what this whole thing was. Like, why would this random girl sit next to me, not play, talk and talk and talk, seem to enjoy being with me there, but, but didn't seem to be showing any signs of romantic or sexual interest? So I figured it out because she told me. She volunteered to me that I reminded her a lot of someone, someone that she misses. The person that I reminded her of was her brother. (laughs) Apparently her brother looked like me and acted like me. I reminded her a lot of him. Hold on. Let me, let me jump in here for a second because I get emotional when you told me the story. Uh, So let me just take over for a second. As Druff alluded to, the Ramada had a train. Uh, it literally had a train. And one night in the late 90s, this girl's brother, as many people do, had a few too many at the Ramada and was hanging out on the train tracks. Now, yeah, you say, well, it's only a little train. It only goes about seven miles an hour. But seven miles an hour can do way more damage at this Ramada Limited Express than you would think. So suffice to say, it didn't end well for the brother. All right, go on, Druff. Yeah, a very sad story. Very, very sad. Yeah. In fact, Druff suspected that's how she even had the money to be playing there to begin with. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) See the irony in that? Her brother got killed by a train at the Ramada, which enabled her to go back to the Ramada and gamble with the said settlement money. Kind of a win-win for everyone, I guess. Yeah, she's she's kind of with him in more ways than one there. So okay, now that's that's <laughs> that, that's not really what happened. There was there wasn't a train accident. That would have been cool if there was though. But but anyway, but there uh, is a train. There, there is, is a train. train yes, there. there is there is like a gimmicky train. I've that, been on it. I've yeah. been on it. I've been on it. <laughs> yeah, I went on it too actually. So the okay, let let's be honest with our listeners. It's a fail train. It is a fail train. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere either. I mean, it literally like takes you like around the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> It's so weird. There's nothing to see. It's like it like encircles the property, but you're like in the parking lot. You get to see where like deliveries are brought into the kitchen. <laughs> There's nothing scenic about it whatsoever. All right, go on. By the way, the Ramada Express is now the Tropicana Laughlin, by the way. There's no more uh, Ramada Express. But anyway, she told me I reminded her of her brother and that I looked like him. I acted like him. The problem was, the reasons why she missed him so much is that he wasn't himself anymore. He had become a drug addict and completely changed. So lo and behold, she's walking through the Ramada Express and sees a guy who looks like her brother and sits down and then reminds her a lot of him personality-wise, too. So she felt like she was spending time with the brother she once knew, not the drug addict brother who completely changed. So that's why she sat there 25 minutes talking to me. Now, unfortunately, 
that is not going to lead to anything romantic or sexual happening. She just wanted to like be with her fake brother at the table. That's all it was. This was not something that's going to spawn into anything else. Interestingly enough, if if I had remi- reminded her of her father, it could have been a different story. A lot of times girls will intentionally or unintentionally date guys who remind them of their dad, but not the brother. That doesn't usually happen where girls date someone who reminds them of their brother. So I, I knew I had no shot there. So I, I actually quit shortly after that and I was kind of frustrated because you know, I'm not saying that I thought she was into me. I'm just saying I was trying to figure out what was going on. I'm going, well, she's not into me. Why would she sit here 25 minutes just talking to me and not even playing? Like, what could be the explanation? Well, I, I got the explanation. So anyway, that that was uh, my little experience at the Ramada Express. Anyway, going on, I mentioned, and we, we had a segment about this on our show uh, a, f- a few years ago, that, uh, or maybe, not, not, I think more like one year ago, not even a few years ago, but uh, I said you could rent sea dews and jet skis to use on the river. The problem is that uh, there's a lot of scam operations and you have to be careful of that. So a lot of these independent operations that don't operate out of one of these hotels, the ones based out of Bullhead, there are scams where they will claim you damage the propeller and charge you like $600. And we, we had a, a victim of that on this show at one point who told this whole story. So I mentioned that in 2013. I didn't mention the scam element, but I learned about that later. The water taxi is interesting. I want to mention the water taxi. And this isn't just about Harris. This is about the, all of Laughlin. So because there's a river, one way you can get around is a boat that just goes back and forth between all the casinos. So you can enter to the backside of these casinos through the water taxi. So you could board the water taxi, for example, at Harris and then take it all the way to the end to Don Laughlin's Riverside Casino. So people understand this, sorry to interrupt you. The whole thing's a novelty, though, because everyone, for the most part, that comes to Laughlin has a car. There isn't any traffic, okay? You could just get in your car, literally, and get there faster than the water taxi. So well, I, I like the water taxi. But... Like, well, no, no, I know. I'm just saying, like, I've done it twice, you know, or three times, maybe, maybe four, out for, you know, 20 years. But most of the time, you would just drive. Like, you know, the only, you know what I mean? That, that there's no... There's no traffic. There's no congestion. There's plenty of parking. I mean, well, there's know, some reasons never... to take the water taxi. You could be drunk. You could just not feel like driving and parking. There's reasons to take the water taxi. It's not a complete gimmick. So, well, but it's more of a novelty than anything. It's okay. Not, well, okay. All right. It, it was uh, four dollars each way when I checked in 2013. I'm sure it's higher today. Uh, what's interesting is I went. I remember in 2001 or two or something. I think it was 2002. I went with my then girlfriend Miri and. We had a different experience where I remember we got on the water taxi, and I think it was actually free somehow, but I know we just kept riding it back and forth, and they didn't charge us. There's no way I would have just kept paying over and over. We actually rode it for a while. Uh, why I, why we did this, I don't remember, but we were just kind of using this as like a boat ride, and they, they didn't stop us. But then in 2013, I saw that it was $4 each way, and today it's probably more than that. Uh, Harris had a shell station outside the casino. I don't know if it's still there, but the prices were very high, as you might imagine. And I noticed that it's the only gas station in Laughlin. It's still there. Yeah, the only one. But that if if you go further down the road away from Laughlin, you can find much cheaper gas. And back in 2013, that I found that the station I went to that was not in Laughlin, where I don't remember where, where it was, but they, it actually did not have an automated card reader at the pump. It was one of those old school pumps that you couldn't use a credit card. You actually had to go in and pay them in advance. <laughs> That's pretty backwards even by uh, 2013 standards. I also noted that at the time that if you drove in from California, you would go on I-40 East and then go north on what's called the Needles Highway, but it was very poorly maintained but that once you got to the Nevada state line, it became smooth and well-maintained. And my theory then was that California doesn't give a shit because they're not making any money from that highway. They're not counting on that highway for tourism money, whereas Nevada does. So Nevada probably maintained it well, and California did not. 
Uh, in some cases, California will contribute if they think it will benefit them in some way. They have uh, cooperated California and Nevada to maintain and expand I-15 between L.A. and Vegas. But apparently in Laughlin, that's not the case. You know, Harris has an adult tower. You know about that? I've had that for years. There's like three towers, child tower, adult tower, and then like central tower. Yeah, well, of course they had it for years. This is from 2013 I was reporting. But um, yeah. they, they, didn't, oh, yeah, yeah. they didn't give me that tower on that particular visit, which was pretty bad because I got stuck next to a loud family and apparently the walls are very thin. So I remember I was kept awake from that whole thing and I was complaining about that in this thread. And also I had an LOL experience in the Harris Casino where I was playing 8-5 bonus poker, this video poker, which is basically identical to 8-5 jacks or better except it pays you more on certain quads. So there's no downside to playing 8-5 bonus poker over 8-5 jacks or better, because you can play the identical strategy. You could change nothing as you play jacks or better, and there's no downside to it, except you'll get paid more with certain quads, like aces, deuces, threes, and fours, especially aces. So why would you not do that? There's no downside, and you'll just get paid more for certain quads. So of course, that would be a no-brainer decision. Now, usually jacks are better will pay more for the flush and full house than bonus poker will. So that's why you may want to consider jacks are better, depending on the pay table. But in Harris Laughlin, there was no 9-5 or 9-6 jacks are better. There's only 8-5 jacks are better. 8 for the full house, 5 for the flush. So the bonus poker was also 8 for the full house, 5 for the flush. And the same pay table for everything is the jacks are better, except, as I said, some of the quads paid better. So there would be no reason, I mean, not even one possible reason to ever play 8-5 jacks or better when there's 8-5 bonus on the same machine. So I'm playing 8-5 bonus, and an old guy sits next to me, and he starts up 8-5 jacks or better. So I think, okay, well, I, let me tell this guy. You know, let me, you know, Maybe he'll get lucky and hit quads, and he'll make extra money from it. Might as well. You know, I, I don't gain anything from giving him advice, but uh, let me help the old guy out. So I told him. I explained exactly what I just explained to you guys. And he said... No, no, that's okay. I'll just stick with this. I said, no, no, you don't understand. It's on the same machine. You don't have to move anywhere. You just press a button. You switch to bonus poker. It's the exact same strategy if you want. It's technically not the exact same strategy, but you can play the exact same strategy. You'll just get paid more. So so it's the exact same strategy, and you'll get uh, more if you get quad aces, deuces, threes, or fours. Otherwise, it's the exact same thing. The pay table is the same otherwise, so there's no reason not to. No, no, that's okay. I'll just stay with this. And I tried in like five different ways to explain to him why this made no sense. Politely, but I was trying to explain it to him. He just kept saying, no, 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 that's okay. That's okay. I, I just would like oh. to stick with this. It's funny you mention that because casinos, for example, such as now the Cosmo, have signs warning patrons against people such as you. <laughs> that try to get old people up from games that are in suboptimal conditions. I'm, not, I'm half kidding, obviously, but the Cosmo does have signs, and some of the other MGM properties do. Yes. Basically warning. Or, do you remember I showed you one of them? when we? Yes, yes, I remember you showed time? me. Yes. And the funny thing is... There are deviant people that may try to get you get make you stand up when the game is in a sub op or a above-optimal play. Be aware of these people. Do not <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, though here, I know you were only joking, but here I wasn't asking him to move anywhere. I was saying, on the same machine, here's bonus poker. I wasn't even saying, hey, get up and move to the other side of the casino or get off this machine you like. Or, it's the same freaking machine. He wouldn't do it, and he understood it. He just kept saying no. It was the weirdest thing. So I gave up. You know, I, I tried. But it's funny how dumb some gamblers are. So th- that these were my observations at the time about... Laughlin, mostly Harris Laughlin, but also just about Laughlin in general. I have another observation right now, and that is that I am tired of just having Brandon on here with me. I'm, I'm feeling just like we like, need some new, we need some new blood, so I'm going to put on some new blood. Yo, buddy, what's happening? Yo, buddy, hey, now, more Jesus, you're up now before four even. You're insane. You're a sick fuck. You're waking up now before four a.m. even. It's like every time we do radio, you're up earlier and earlier. 
soon you're just going to be waking up when the show's starting. That's good. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it gets there where he's waking up at like uh, 9:30 p.m. and then we can just have him the whole time. It's 3:53 and he's awake. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Of course I'm up early because got shit to do. But I thought you. You're not even you sleeping. Up, you're not even sleeping. Show. You're not even sleeping six hours these days. I mean, we talked. Uh, you and I talked on the phone at like yeah, 10 o'clock at night. Jesus, no, how are you I, doing? Nine, Why don't nine, you try nine, to get five, seven hours? Yeah, all right. Well, some days I sleep much less than that. Well, some days I'll sleep like th- four hours, three hours. Uh, you know, depends on the day. Now, Trader Ruski, we're talking about a legend. Let's see if you can guess this legend. A legend just recently died in Laughlin, Nevada, and that's the subject we're on. Do you know who that legend was? Hmm. No, I did not hear about that. Okay. All right. Hold on. The legend owned the Riverside Casino in Laughlin. Do you know who he was? Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll give you one more clue. He was a founding member of the city. Do you know who this legend was? Joe Laughlin. Close. Joe. Not just the funny. Close. Don, Don Laughlin just passed Joe. You're so funny. Don Laughlin passed away last week, buddy. How'd you miss that? Wow. It was not on my radar. 92 years old. How did no one see that one coming? Just makes you think, huh? Life is precious. So anyhow, uh, I've stayed there as well. And you can see how Harris Laughlin was like the sparkling crown jewel back in 1988. But, you know, kind of like other Caesar properties, if there are listeners that have been to them, uh, it remains trapped in time. And it looks as if it has not been touched at all since 1988 when it was built. Uh, it became somewhat notorious, infamous, in 2002, when what occurred on the property one Sunday evening. That I don't know. What happened in 2002? The two arch-enemy rival biker gangs, the Mongoloids and the uh, what's the other group, the big one? Um, what's the, the biggest bike group in the world? Bike gang, I should say. Criminal gang. Um, Hell's Angels. The Hells, uh, Hell, yeah, Hell's Angels, yeah. Uh, yes. They got into a all-out brawl with gunfire in one of the pits. Okay, literally like blackjack, playing blackjack, and there was a big, uh, I think three people died. There was a shootout in the casino in a brawl. And obviously, being that Laughlin is in Clark County, um, they literally did not have the police force Uh, in Laughlin, there's like a substation there, but you know, they don't have that kind of crime there. There's, you know, one murder a year, some years, no murders, no crime. So they didn't even have enough time to get reinforcement. They had to obviously have, uh, law enforcement from Arizona across the river. And then they did come from Clark County or from Las Vegas, but obviously it took them, you know, even speeding and going and Fast as they can, but so safely, like an hour. Anyhow, that was all over the news. The trial, the uh, one leader of the Hell's Angels, the guy that was like the leader, um, you know, of the of the chapter or whatever, served prison time. Probably still in prison. I mean, there was murders, but they just had video footage of the terrified people. Like chips were being flown in the air, tables were being overturned, like in the middle of, you know, just everyone's normal, you know, whatever, you know, afternoon, evening. There was an all-out brawl and war and shootout, and I'm pretty sure it's still going on now. Once a week, oh, I'm sorry, once a week, once a year, they have an event down there called, uh, it's like Bike Week, but it's like called the River Run or something like that, where motorcycle enthusiasts from all over the world bring their bikes there. And it used to be a massive event, in fact, uh, up until recently, like the pandemic, and I'm going to Google it in a second and see if I'm sure it's still going on. It was literally the biggest event of the year in Laughlin. Um, basically like New Year's Eve or Super Bowl weekend in Vegas. Like, you could not get rooms there. And then when you could get rooms in Laughlin, they were, like, insane. They were, like, Vegas prices. You know, they are like, you know, not insane, but, you know, for Laughlin, insane. Like, three, $400 a night for, like, standard, like, beat-down 40-year-old rooms. So, anyhow, uh, when I first moved down here to Vegas, uh, that was all over the news. This biker war thing that happened, the trials and just you know, everything behind it, because at the time it was like the worst uh, violence that had ever occurred. Maybe it still is like in, you know, like a big chain casino. Like it was, you know, you don't really hear about shootings and violence inside casinos, you know, knock on wood. Thankfully. Well, except in so, 2020, yeah, you, was, you heard some of that. 
Except for what? In 2020, during the pandemic in Vegas, you had some of that. Or 21, actually. It was when it, yeah, but not, yeah, but not like that where, you know what I mean, like where it, it, it took them like 45 minutes to get the, get the casino under, under authority's control. Like it was an outright like chaos for, you know, but yeah, 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 but, well, you know, whatever. It, it, at the time, then, I guess it was the biggest. Um, all right, so I've stayed there. It's beat down. It's older. Um, there's no diamond lounge for those that are diamond that wonder there's none in the state of Nevada. There used to be a nice old diamond lounge where you could go there and get, you know, snacks, soups, pizza, whatever. Have you ever been to that diamond lounge in, uh, Laughlin? I might've been, I just don't remember if I have. All right. It was on the river too. Um, you know, so, you know, nice views, but that's all gone too. Uh, and so they do the same thing that other Caesars properties do for diamond members early, actually diamond plus in lieu of. The Diamond Lounge, they give you your four free drinks at the value of $25 each drink. You can use it at Starbucks, at restaurants. Uh, the food choices have just gone continually more and more downhill um, at every property. Um, every property has like one, one at the most halfway decent restaurant, and that's like literally it. Unless you want to eat like fast food, you know, uh, normally when I'm there, at least once a trip, but I'm only there for like two days, I go to the In-N-Out Burger. There's one In-N-Out Burger. Harris has a great steakhouse. I think it's called The Range, but don't hold me to it. It might not be. Um, and I've eaten there many times over the years, and it's good. Uh, slightly below Vegas prices, but slightly above what you'd pay at a normal steakhouse. Um, outside of that, I've had breakfast uh, at their coffee shop, and that's fine. Like, you know, it's hard to screw up eggs and toast and, you know, potatoes, but everything else is, is really bad. They have, like, a little food court that maybe it has, like, a Carl's Jr. or you know, McDonald's, it, it, the names have changed, but there's like a burger place, an ice cream place, a pizza place, like fast food. There's a Mexican Guy Fieri place. That's awful. I know who will agree with you wholeheartedly on that one, and that would be Benjamin's mom. So one of the oh. years, I think this was in like 16 or something, we were in Vegas, and it was my birthday, actually. It was the, the last day of the trip. We went to Death Valley, and then we went to Vegas. I think it was 16. And it was on my birthday, was the final day of the trip, and we would be driving back to California. However, the traffic was absolutely horrendous going back. I mean, it was so bad that not only was it terrible to where you had to go around like through searchlight to not get stuck on the horrendous jam of the 15, it extended so far past the state line that even the searchlight trick wasn't going to work. So I figured out that the only way not to just sit for hours and hours and hours in traffic going south on the 15 was to go all the way to Laughlin and then join the 40 and then go back west on the 40, which is way out of the way. So we did it. It was better to drive and be moving than to sit in these hours of traffic. So we did it. And so as we were getting close to Laughlin. And as I mentioned before, the freeway doesn't go right by Laughlin. You have to get off and go on a surface street for a little bit. So we weren't passing right by, but pretty close. Before I was going to get to where the 40 was, I said, you know, if everybody's hungry here, I actually have a food comp at Harris for like 60 bucks or something. So why don't we just use that? Otherwise, I wouldn't have come all the way to Laughlin for a $60 food comp, and the food is fail here anyway. But, you know, since we're here anyway, do you want to try? So she said yes. So it was me, her, and I believe a five-year-old Benjamin. And we go into Harris, and, of course, the choices are a complete fail, as you said. And we saw El Burro Baracho, which is Guy Fieri's place. And it was fairly new at the time. In fact, it may have been brand new. And I think this is the first time we ever ate there. I believe Bugio still existed in the Rio at that point and hadn't yet been replaced. So I think this is my first time ever in one of these. They had all this gear, all this crap you could buy that was like memorabilia from the show that uh, we saw people buying a lot of, which was pretty surprising that people are buying all this shit. But we, we sat down in there, and yeah, it was pretty fail. Like She, she was uh, not happy with this meal. And, and at the end of it said that she doesn't ever want to go to Laughlin again and doesn't, doesn't ever want to eat here again. Yeah. And uh, that, that even for the, I mean, the comp. If you're, if you're getting it, it's one thing if it's a comp, because at least whatever we didn't pay. 
But imagine you're staying there and you pay for it as well. It's fine. Well, right, and that's that's what she said. She said she's fine with our decision because it was it was very close to free after the sixty dollar comp. I think it was probably like you know, sixty five dollars or something. So, the bill. So, so for me, you know, I don't know. Everyone's different. It's a personal thing, but for me, food is a big part of my everyday life. So if I travel somewhere on a vacation, especially, and the food is poor, it's going to impact my feelings and my enjoyment of of that trip. And I've noticed over the years that I find myself each time I, I go to Laughlin uh, being annoyed and enjoying myself less and less because of the poor food. Um, so, like, yeah, like, you know, every place kind of has an okay to decent, like, steakhouse or, like, you know, whatever. But, you know, you can't eat that every day. And you can't eat that for lunch. And, you know, sometimes you just don't want to have, like, a big drawn-out meal. Like, so, for example, the Aquarius, they have a steak. They have an outback there. The Golden Nugget has the Bubba Gump, like, what is it? I think it's just called Bubba Gump, but, you know, like that shrimp place. And they also have, like, a steakhouse. Those are our two main restaurants. Uh, Riverside has, like, a Don La- the Don Laughlin Steakhouse, which is okay, but not great. And these are, like, Vegas high-end type places, but, you know, they're okay. They're like, basically, they're, like, Outback quality type places. But outside of that, like, you know, for lunch, if you wanted, you know, like, any Asian food or you know, noodles or, you know, sandwiches, barbecue, like there's really none of that. Like there just isn't, you got to like go to a coffee shop or like, you know, like that sale, uh, Mexican place that we just mentioned, or there's a bunch of like, there's a bunch of Panda Expresses and like those kind of McDonald's, which, you know, I don't really eat that kind of food. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing I'll, I'll say is if anyone that's listening, uh, wants to go to Vegas. The one good thing is, yeah, the rooms are less. The resort fees are way less. I think Harrods, for instance, is like $13. Don Laughlin is like $8. Like the resort fees, the rooms, you know, but you're also, you know, you're paying what you're getting for. Like these aren't, you know, newer rooms. But if you have families, kids, younger, you know, children, uh, you would probably want to stay at Don Laughlin's Riverside because although, you know, it's kind of old now, uh, they do have, more amenities by far for children than any other property uh, in Laughlin. They have a movie theater, the only movie theater in Laughlin. They have like a laser tag, like thing for kids, you know, which we actually did once. It's, it's fine. You know, kids, kids would really like it. They have a full, like, you know, full on arcade with like maybe 30 or 40 games. Um, you know, so that's it. And they have a bowling alley too. It's not 24 hours. But they have a bowling alley, the only one in Laughlin. So you're not going to find any, all the other places more or less are just casinos that, you know, they don't have other amenities. Like, you know, in Vegas, you'll find like, you know, something for kids, some kind of, you know, an arcade, whatever it may be. So uh, outside of that, yeah, that's really Laughlin. And if you just want like a laid back place where the drinks are free and you used to be able to say, oh, in the limits or, 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 you know, you can go there. It used to be five. Everything was like five, but now it's 10. So like you can go there and find $10 blackjack, $10 craps, maybe five during the week, you know, during like the days, but it's never going to be quarter tables. I mean, they have them, but you're never going to find quarter minimums. You know, uh, you're going to find low end machines, you know, penny machines, nickel video poker, things of that nature. In fact, one of their casinos, uh, the pioneer actually still has the old school coin. You know, the majority of the machines are coin out machines versus uh, Tito tickets. So if you like that old feel with a bucket and all that, like you can still even find that there. Um, and then if you want to be a little adventurous, I've always found this so strange because you don't really hear about it much. Most people don't even know about it, but if you're going North on the Laughlin strip, when you pass Harris, which again is the last casino, uh, you go about another seven miles or so on the same road. What will you, what will you stumble into Druff? Now, I think that, uh, Harris is South, by the way. Okay, then south. Yeah, I, I was kind of... So I'm, I'm confused, confused by your question. It is south. It is south. <laughs> it's south. It is south. You're right. You're right. You're right. So if you go south, thank you, and you pass Harris, you're exiting Laughlin, and you go about six, seven miles, what will you stumble? What will you run right into? Um, I'm trying to remember. Wow. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's a casino. That's a, it's a, some weird casino. Yes, that's what I'm about to talk about. Yes. Right. What is it called? Oh, it has a strange name to it. I don't remember it anymore. Okay, so it's called the Avi Casino, A-V-I. That's right. So when you hear that, okay, so when you hear that, what would you think? What would, like, if no one told you nothing else and you nothing about it, and you say, hey, there's a casino, it's called the Avi, 
casino, AVI, what would you think it was? What does it sound like? It sounds like some foreign-owned casino. Sounds like maybe a Jewish casino yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, what is it? What is it actually? I don't, I've never been inside there. I don't know much about it. It's a small... Huh? I, I've never been inside of it. I've just seen it. I, yeah, I've been inside it. So there's a small sliver of land right in like, again, right in that little corner between Arizona, Nevada, and California. That's an Indian reservation. Ah, oh, okay. They have a casino called the Avi Casino, which it gets no press. No one talks about it. You never see ads. And it's a resort with a hotel. Um, I went there once, walked around. It was dead as can be. There was nothing going on inside there. There was no reason to be there. We were in and out in maybe 15 minutes. We went, like, to see if there was any promotion for, like, a new player's card. We walked around, looked at the machines, the games. There was no draw. And it was, like, half empty. It's, you remember that movie, uh, Reindeer Games, with uh, Ben Affleck yeah. and... Uh, you know, okay, remember when they were like these dumpy casinos that, you know, they remember that on Christmas it got robbed? It's like that. It looked like that. Like this is local casino. Everyone knew each other. This is dumpy, old, beat down casino. That's what it was. It was really strange because now, like nowadays, you hear about these Indian casinos and they're all like these high end Vegas type mega resorts. This is the exact opposite. But again, it's so strange because you never see flyers, mailers. There's billboards like when you get close to Laughlin advertising it. And if, you know, you don't see that, you're not even going to know it exists. Yeah, I was surprised when I saw it. I remember I was driving in that direction, and I said, what is this over here? It's just away from everything. And I think I do remember noticing it was part of the tribe there. But I remember it was yeah, right on the river, but and it's right on the, the, yep. the three corners area it's we just talked end. about. Yep. yep. So the only thing maybe, like, it gets a big draw from, like, California, you know, like, Needles area, because it's the closest technically to, you know, like, where those people live. Kind of how, like, Baker to, you know, state line is. But outside of that, I don't. I never really got it. Well, so. there actually is. Yeah, yeah, that's, there, there is a way to get there from Fort Mojave, which has like sixteen thousand people. There's a road that goes directly west that that makes that the closest resort to Fort Mojave. That's probably where they get most of their business. Okay, it makes sense. So you know, again, to close in closing, the one thing I'll say is, if you want a no frills gambling vacation, if you want a absolutely low cost of food okay not much entertainment you don't care about that stuff and you just want a room to sleep in and eat and if you gamble decently you know like by you know like low ball low roller standards in vegas uh would probably translate into laughlin like getting your rooms comped or you know definitely you'll get offers you, you know you get food maybe taken care of on the back end you know i go there every so often and i every month from every single month and i haven't stayed there like in three years i get Free two nights a month from Don Laughlin in <laughs> Riverside. Every month they send me a little index card, like a little white card that has two free nights on it. And I, I've, it's been three years. Every single month I get it. So they'll comp you if you gamble. They'll probably comp your food. You won't spend much. Lower limits. But outside of that, there are no frills. If, like, the wifey, you know, is used to, like, the shopping or shows or nightlife, you're not going to find any of that there. Uh, you know, if you just want to gamble and that's what you like to do, you'll be fine. They have all the newest machines, the newest games, all that stuff is, is modern. Um, but outside of that, uh, you know, and they will have like shows a couple times a year. But Laughlin, I like to laugh. It's like the last stop before you end up on like Boulder Highway in Nevada. Like Boulder Highway is like the last stop for like acts that can't get booked anywhere else else in Nevada. Like, you know, you go on this, you go to the Strip. And then when the strip isn't working anymore, you're like you're at the Orleans, you're at Sam's Town, maybe Gold Coast, you know, Sun Coast, you know, the locals places. Then after that, you're kind of out of Las Vegas. You know, you go to Laughlin, and then once Laughlin's done, you go to the Boulder Highway Strip. I don't know; people probably don't know that, but there's a second strip in Vegas that's on a road called Boulder Highway, which is a very, uh, very shady area. And there's a number of casinos on Boulder Highway. Um, and you'll see, like, you know, I don't know, I'm just making this up, but, like, Kenny Loggins or, you know, people that were, like, relevant in the 80s and you haven't heard of them in 30, 40 years, but they still want to perform. Like, they're, you know, like, just on the telltale end. For the most part, that's kind of what Laughlin gets. You're never going to get someone that's, like, relevant now. But they do have some kind of shows once in a while. There's a convention center there, like a little mini arena. Um, but it's not anything most of, I guess, well, maybe some. Maybe some of this audience would like, you know, some of the, 
retro stuff from like the eighties. Like Dion Warwick would be in Laughlin. That's a good example. Like someone like that. Like, you know what I mean? It's people that are just literally on the tail end and either need the money or they just want to perform. So uh but that's basically it. Normally when I go there, the most I can stay is two nights and usually after one night I'm ready and done. Like I'm ready to come back home. Yeah, that's how I feel too. You go with a bunch of friends and you get excited. Oh, we're going to Laughlin because half of the fun is just the drive because you can't go fast and kind of open road. And then you get there and it's kind of a letdown. Like, <laughs> oh, what now? You know? And, so. and by the way, uh, speaking of performers that have been in Laughlin, there was actually a performer who was a prominent comedian who died th- over 30 years ago on the way to perform at the Riverside Casino. Do you know who that is? Or was, shall I say? I don't know. No. Sam Kinison. Oh, yeah. It's a car accident death. Yes. Sam Kinison was on the way to Laughlin from Vegas. And he was... Oh, wow. I didn't know that. He yeah. on those roads. Right. And he was... Uh, actually, he wasn't coming from Vegas. I think he was from... Uh, I think he was coming from California. Wh- wherever he, he was going to Laughlin to perform at the Riverside. And he was on the Needles Highway... And a pickup truck driven by a 17-year-old struck him heads on. And uh, the, the the 17-year-old was drunk. So you would have expected that an accident like this would be Sam Kinison's fault. It wasn't. He, he it was no, no fault, but it killed him. And uh, his wife is in the car with him, too, but she survived. And he was only 38 years old when he's pronounced dead and uh, this wow. this death affected someone that you've met and that would be Dave Learman who now has passed away as well and uh, that's because Dave Learman and his comedy partner Doug Beatty who was a really tiny guy like you know, two feet tall with a uh, cerebral palsy was cerebral palsy he had some major condition I'm forgetting if it's cerebral palsy it's a major condition which is part of why he was so short but anyway um they were part of Sam's act and touring with him. And uh, Dave would pretend to be an audience member who would call his ex-girlfriend on the phone. And you know, there's a whole act with that. And then they'd bring Doug up there who would you know, look all pathetic. Like this, this tiny guy who you could tell is in terrible condition. And then he's got like this foul mouth. And uh, you, you wouldn't expect this from someone like that. Like this tiny, pathetic looking guy who's like this, got this foul mouth. So they, they, they did that act on, on Howard Stern later, but this was the beginning of it, and they were touring with Kinnison, and then this derailed that whole thing when Kinnison was killed. No, I just read, I didn't know this. I mean, I know about the death. I even knew it was a car accident. I didn't know where it was. I, you know, I'm sure I did at some point, but it was before I lived out here. You know, I remember Sam Kinnison from, you know, Police Academy movies as a comedian. It says on Wikipedia, just to tell you how much. Uh, the times have changed. The person that killed him was drunk. That you know, the, the pickup truck that hit him was drunk, and he got a year probation and three hundred hours of community service. Yeah, well, he was seventeen though, so that that was probably some of it. He was what? He was seventeen. The driver. Well, you know, I bet if a seventeen-year-old did that today, he wouldn't get off like that. They'd be charged with as an adult. He'd, he'd see some prison time. Drunk driving, killing someone. You think a 17-year-old is going to get probation for that? Probably know. not. Yeah. Oh, you know, one last thing. I'll just tell you. The poker scene. It's kind of weird. It's gone up and down over the years there. But as of right now, like, you know, when the poker boom kind of has been up, you know, there's a, another room. Then, you know, poker boom kind of fades. They close the room. So it's been pretty consistent now, for those that want to know. There's two poker rooms in Laughlin, and only one of them is open seven days a week. There's a poker room at Harris, which is closed like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they have like tournaments on the days are open. And I'm sure cash games, I haven't played during years. They used to have a circuit event way, way back during the poker boom, but they haven't had that in a decade. And the only room with a 24 hour poker, a 24 hour poker room is at the Riverside. And two things. Thing number one, uh, one of the first times I was ever in Laughlin, so maybe 2004, five, uh, I was in the poker room for their little goofy little tournament that they have. And I'm going to get to that in a second in the morning. They have like this goofy morning tournament that I played in 2004. And as of, you know, recently as last year when I was there, although I didn't play it, it's still going on. Uh, but 
the interesting thing was the first time I ever stayed at the Riverside, I played in that poker tournament. It was there. It starts at nine in the morning. And sure as hell, Don Laughlin was in there uh, drinking a cup of coffee, chatting everyone up. And apparently he was like a regular, like he would call mingle, very personable. In fact, I even spoke with him. Like I didn't realize at the time, like what a luminary he was. And, you know, I guess a legend, but he was there in the room and, you know, he like would call the poker manager by his first name, Bill, and then they'd say Don. Like very friendly, knew everyone. I don't know. I doubt he would ever play poker. I don't even know. I can't remember if I was told if he was even a poker enthusiast, but he was certainly in that room. And apparently, he had made you know appearances almost every day. He'd come into the poker room and chat with people and talk. But okay, so this is a funny thing. So they have a tournament uh, at the Riverside. It's every day of the week or every day during the, the the weekdays. I don't know about the weekends. I played it with Jeannie maybe five or six times over you know the course of living out here. And this is how it works. The tournament starts at nine o'clock. This is the craziest thing. Tell me if you've ever heard anything even close to this. The tournament starts at nine o'clock. Okay. They have rebuys until nine twenty. At ten o'clock, they announce last five hands. Okay. And then you play five more hands and like whatever it is, like, you know, top five get paid, top three get paid, whatever it is. After they announce five last hands, they just count down the chips to determine who finishes first, second, third, fourth, <laughs> fifth, and it ends. Okay, it ends. The first time I played it, I thought it was the stupidest thing, and I didn't understand it. And then, like, I, you know, went a couple other times, and I'm like, all right, it's kind of cute. Like, it's weird. It's odd. It's... And the funny thing is, the first time I was there, what do you think they do when they get down to, like, the, the final five hands or whatever? They normally just agree to chop, okay? And anyone that's still left in it, you know, would, would chop. And, like, I remember the first time I played it with Jeannie, uh, there was, like, 12 people in it. And this is only a $20 buy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 20 well, And there's, really like, $20, you know, I guess they call it a rebuy, but most people don't even do that. So it's only a $20 tournament. So, like, there's, like, 10 people left when they said, you know, last five hands, and everyone's like, okay, Bill, like, you know, good, see you tomorrow. And they just assumed it was going to be a chop. But Jeannie are like, what are we doing here? Like, you know, we wanted to play the last five hands, and we, you know. <laughs> So, and we got like the, obviously the most awful stares and looks from these locals. And I don't remember what we did, like if we kept playing or so long ago, but in subsequent trips there, we would just end up doing whatever the locals wanted, like we would, which was chop. They're all used to it. So like literally there, I'm not making this up. Literally there are occasions where you buy into a $20 tournament and you chop and you get like $24 back or $27 back or, you know, cause even, even the most ridiculous thing, I don't remember the exact number, but even the house. Uh, the house big on that tournament, you know, what they collect is massive. Like, it's nothing. But, like, they all do it, and they all enjoy it. And, like, literally, some days you wouldn't even make $10. You get your money back plus, like, 7 bucks. That, I that's funny. I that once, and, like, literally not making $10, like, in cashing in the tournament. But they never played out, and it's the strangest thing. Right at 10 o'clock on the knot, on the, you know, on the nose, they say last five hands, and then the tournament's over. And they just chop. Or they don't even do the last five hands normally because they just chop. It's very, very strange. They don't play it through. They last five well, maybe that's the way that my ex-girlfriend from 1989 got some Hendon Mob results. <laughs> huh? Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting, I think Harris is different, but I, but everywhere, everywhere else, and there used to be poker at the uh, Colorado Bell. They have this weird, goofy, druff. You'd like this uh, spread limit version of poker where they play there, where it's two eight spread limit. And what that means is you can raise anywhere pre-flop from $2 to $8 arbitrarily. Blinds are, are one, two, one dollar, two dollar. And then you could literally open pre-flop to two. Okay. Or I guess you, I guess, yeah, I guess two would just be a call, but you could open from, I guess, three or four to eight. So then there's, you know, people call whatever they do. They fold. Then there's a flop. Okay. And then obviously the first person to act can bet anywhere from two to eight on the turn two to eight and on the river two to eight. And, you know, obviously you can like raise in increments of what they bet, but it's, it's the two to eight spread limit. And they've always had that. They've always had that. And I think at Harris, they, I mean, they could have anything, you know, they could have no limit, but that's just the game that the locals choose to play. Um, which I've always found interesting because I've never seen that in, in Vegas anywhere. Like there'd be like, you know, four, eight limit hold them or even two, four, eight, 16, but it's, it's two, eight spread limit where you literally can bet any <laughs> amount you determine between two and eight dollars at any point, 
So yeah, it is kind of odd. It's a weird, weird, you know, ecosystem of, of poker down there. I remember once, like over the years, you know, the uh, Colorado Bell had poker. Colorado Bell closed during the pandemic and never reopened. I went down there once, just to tell you, people listening, how big the poker boom was at one point. I went down there with Jeannie and, funny enough, of all people, Goldfarb and a couple other friends, and they had a huge poker tournament at the Golden Nugget. They had a poker room at the Golden Nugget. It's been closed now for a decade. And they must have had like two, 300 people playing it. It was massive. They had multiple day ones. I mean, this is just how big the poker boom was at one point. Like, this is like 15 years ago now that, you know, 14, 15 years ago that that happened. But uh, anyhow, yeah, you know, it, I guess for the nostalgia, like, it's kind of a cool place. And that's normally why I go there. But I find myself each time I do go more and more, you know, each time asking myself, why did I come here? You know what I mean? Whereas like in the beginning, I remember liking it. Whereas now it's just kind of like I get hyped or, you know, we all get hyped and excited and we get there and we're kind of let down, um, you know, for the numerous reasons I mentioned. So anyhow, that's all I got on that. Oh, oh, it's okay. Hey, Trader Ruski, are you still with us? <laughs> Nobody. He may be gone. Ask him if he's ever been to Laughlin. Oh, okay. Well, can you see? Okay. All right. Would you bet he's been to Laughlin or he hasn't? I would think he hasn't. Yeah, I don't think he has either. So, but anyhow, yeah, like you know, I mean, the one thing I can say is, that if you've never been comp and you kind of want to be spoiled in like, like a white trashiest kind of way, like go to Laughlin. You know, if you play, you know, quarters, you're going to get everything taken care of. You know, you'll get you know your rooms comped and you know anything within reason. You know, it, it's kind of like how Vegas used to be. Give them some action. You don't have to nitpick and, you know, argue with hosts and, you know, that sort of thing. They'll usually take care of you. So. Yeah. There's some people who like it for that reason. They think it's like a low-key Vegas and reminds them a lot of the older time Vegas that before it changed. So that's that's why it still has some loyal people to go there. So there are bed bugs in Las Vegas on the Strip. And it's getting harder and harder to avoid them because there are a lot of properties now where bed bugs have been found. It's interesting because this first came to, first came to light several months ago. This isn't a new story. Maybe it's new that it's it's picked up traction and more properties. But there was an initial story in the summer where there are about seven or eight hotels that have them. So apparently, I guess they haven't been able to find a way to get rid of them. Yes. So there have now been nine different strip hotels that have been found with bed bugs. As of August 12th, there were seven hotels, but there are two more that have been found since then. And maybe even more after that, because this article I'm referring to was written on October 19th. By the way, of all things, the... By the way, of all things, the author of this article on Casino.org that I'm reading from is named Corey Levitan. And I was very surprised to see that name because I used to read I him. Know that name. I used to read him all the time. I know that name. You probably do because he, he writes a lot of articles now for the for this, for the Review Journal. Like he's written a lot of articles in Vegas. He's been in Vegas a while. I noticed that he was in Vegas for whatever reason. I noticed maybe about a year ago, but For a long time, I hadn't noticed he was in Vegas, and I read him in the 90s in a local newspaper where I used to live in Southern California. And apparently, that was his first job. And he wrote kind of like these uh, humorous articles about stuff in the local area. I really liked his columns, and I always looked forward to reading them in the local newspaper. And I was so surprised to see that name again, and it's the same guy. And I've I've talked to him since, and he was surprised I remembered some of his articles. But so he wrote this one, and you'll you'll see he has a lot of articles on uh, Casino.org. He's a good writer. He always writes good stuff here. But he wrote about the bed bugs here, and on August 12th, it it, it was reported that in the prior two years, so that is a wide range of time, but in the prior two years, they had found bed bugs at Circus Circus, Caesar's Palace, Planet Hollywood, the Palazzo, Tropicana, MGM Grand, and Sahara. However, they found bed bugs this summer and this fall at 
the Venetian and Park MGM, which is the former Monte Carlo. That makes nine hotels that have had bed bugs that were found in the last two years, two of which were pretty recent. The Tropicana issued a statement saying that they conduct comprehensive preventative maintenance programs. They said, while highly unlikely in the event of a complaint, we immediately isolate the effective room, the affected room and its surrounding areas. At that point, a third party service will evaluate the situation and provide a recommendation on appropriate next steps, including professional treatment should anything be found. Have you ever had bed bugs in any hotels you stayed at, like in your room, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. I have not either. I've never, I've never, I've never experienced any of the symptoms that would come from them either. So no. I've, yeah, I, I, I have not either. I've, I've never had a bed bug bite, to my knowledge, and they're pretty small. They, they tend to range from one millimeter to seven millimeters. They're usually like reddish brown. They're small and flat. They will bite people and animals when they sleep. So that's why they're called bed bugs because they're not necessarily in your bed but they will bite you while you're in your bed. For whatever reason, they don't like attacking mammals when they're uh, awake, maybe for uh, safety reasons. For their safety, I'm talking about, not yours. So something to be aware of, and you can probably tell from this list of affected hotels that it's not like all dump hotels. It's a mixture of high-end hotels and not high-end hotels. That the cleanliness of a room has nothing to do with the presence of bed bugs. So you shouldn't say, oh, this property is messy and isn't cleaned well, so they probably have bed bugs. That's not how it works. Now, it can be affected by how the property chooses to take care of it. So if it's a shitty property and they just decide to do nothing about it when they hear about it, then it is more likely that you will run into bed bugs than a property that will jump and take action. But as far as them showing up in the first place, it really has nothing to do with how clean the property is. It's nothing like roaches that can be attracted to trash. That's not how bed bugs are. So the way bed bug risk can be elevated is if people are visiting from regions of the world where they're more prevalent. I don't know what those regions are, but that's thought to be what brings them where people actually bring them along with them unknowingly. And once you have bed bugs, uh, once you've been bitten by them, uh, you really have to watch out at that point because you can end up bringing them home with you. And it's actually recommended uh, by some people to, to throw away any clothes you brought on that trip because they may be in your clothes. And uh, there's also a recommendation if you don't want to throw away the clothes, you can put them in a, in a plastic bag and seal it very tightly to where uh and then leave them for a long time to where the bed bugs are just stuck there and can't bite and you know can't feed and will die but otherwise you can actually bring them home with you and then it, it can be very hard to get rid of them we actually had a listener do you remember a duped samaritan we haven't heard from him in a while but do you remember duped samaritan yeah, yeah. He, he was bitten by bed bugs in atlantic city i think it was at harris and uh he he really got terrible bites from it. Like, they had bites all over his body, and then he had to throw away clothes that were there. So he complained to Harris about it, and uh, they offered him $750. And I told him that's the magic number there. I said, what, what they do at Caesars Properties and at many properties, that what will happen is the... 750 is the number that their insurance will pay out with very little or no investigation. The, it's basically like a nuisance claim number. And once it gets past 750, then it becomes a much bigger deal for you to get paid that. So, so if you have any issue with any property where it eventually gets referred to their insurance or risk management, uh, if you're willing to take 750, they'll give you 750. So you should keep that in mind. If you've got something you're looking for, you might as well ask for 750 because they'll give it very fast. No point to ask for 400 or 500. If you think it's something worth 400, ask for 750. They may give it to you because they'll they'll snap accept 750 usually. But if you think you're going to get 1,000, 2,000, you're not going to get it. They're going to put a lot of fight for that. So I, I was telling him that. And, and interestingly, interestingly enough, when he was negotiating with them, they went up to 750 and stopped. So I was explaining that to him. So I, I don't remember if he accepted it or not. He wasn't happy with the number given what he went through there. But 
you should complain to the hotel and try to get some compensation. Don't just say, oh, well, you know, that's it. I'll just deal with, you know, they, they, they will usually give you something if you've been affected by bed bugs. There is a recommendation to put your luggage in the bathtub without unzipping it before you do a bed bug check because the bed bugs are never sitting in the bathtub and basically uh, this uh, would allow you to check the bed and the couches for either bed bugs themselves, blood stains, or small black dots on the bed. So that is a check you can do. It's not foolproof, of course, but those are all signs of uh, bed bugs. If you see this stuff, of course, you can switch rooms. And they're saying if you put your luggage in the bathtub, then it's unlikely to get infested by the bed bugs while you're looking. Of course, this is without opening it. But but I think even in the bathtub with opening it, they're just not usually in there, and they're usually looking for you, not your stuff. But they will sometimes get within your stuff, you know, if they're in the room and you just leave the luggage open. But I, I think that's just too much of a burden, to be honest. Like, I've never once done this. I've never pulled back the sheets and checked the mattress bedding and the couches. It's, it's just one of these things that unless I happen to see it, I, I think if there's bed bugs in the room, it's just going to hit me. But it couldn't be that common because I've been to so many rooms and I've just never once been bitten by bed bugs. So I think you just have to get pretty unlucky for this to occur. So don't, don't panic too much about the bed bugs, even though it's now been found in nine different uh, strip casinos in uh, the last two years. Also keep in mind, there's tons of rooms in these casinos. So we're dealing with many, many thousands of rooms when you add these nine casinos together. So they're not saying this was found in every room there. It was just found at le- in at least one room in each of these places. So uh, that's not a major infestation necessarily. It's just something that... Uh, was found, and it's just kind of inevitable with so many people coming through that some people may accidentally bring bed bugs with them. So that's uh, really all I have to say about the bed bugs. Don't panic too much about them, but they are in the news. Yeah. Although they did say the one thing, uh, and maybe you said it. I'm sorry if you did. Did you say the one thing that the, the, the most, uh, I guess, suggested way to prevent them from spreading and coming home with you? Did you read that? No. So they say when you're in the hotel, do not put your luggage or clothing. I don't know why anyone would put clothing, but luggage would make sense on the floor because that's where they jump to. So like when your luggage is like, say it's on the carpet, uh, put it somewhere elevated because the most common way that people bring them home is suitcases or clothing or articles of clothing are on the floor and they jump to that and they go with you. If you have your, they, I guess they can't fly or they can't jump, it says. So if you have your suitcases and your clothing elevated, like on those, you know, racks that they have, you know, suitcase racks or even, I guess, putting it on a table, um, that will prevent it from getting into your clothes, and that's the most common way that you can bring them with you. Okay. Um, that's actually a good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. I usually yeah. have my luggage elevated in some way, not because of bed bugs, but just because... I'm tall and I'm getting older and I don't like bending all the way down to the floor to get yeah. things. Uh, but I will sometimes throw clothes that I've taken off on the floor. So do not do that. I guess I shouldn't do that. Anymore. Yeah. Okay. Nope. I'll start getting a bed bug parent. Put them directly, like put them like directly in the laundry bag or, you know, even yeah. put them in like in one of the dressers that are, you know, in hotels that you don't use, but yeah, don't throw them on the floor. Yeah. All right. Well, good suggestion. Yeah. All right, so I want to talk about the Culinary Union and their control over the Las Vegas Strip, which is really the best and most honest way to put it, because that's what they have. So this union is really not appropriately named, because you would think the Culinary or Culinary Union, whatever you want to say it, is something that would have to do with restaurants. You would think it's only restaurant workers and maybe any kind of food stand, but you wouldn't expect it would be anything beyond that, but that's not true. Well, there's a reason for that, though. That I never bothered to look up. When they first started, when they first, uh, you know, gathered many, many moons ago, the majority of their membership were initially food, food employees, bussers, servers, this was back in an era 
where the majority of restaurants in each and every casino on the Strip were owned by said casino, hence the reason why, you know, they were union members. Whereas now, you know, like think of Caesars, for instance, or, you know, whatever, even MGM. Think of how many of the restaurants they have that are actually owned by the casino versus outsourced, leased, whatever. So all those restaurants that are in casinos that are owned by other people. So like, we'll just say like Spago, for instance, at the Bellagio. Okay. Or even now the coffee shop at, at Bellagio, those don't own, those aren't owned by the casino anymore. So the employees that work there, the bussers, the cooks, the dishwashers, they're not union employees. But back when the union started, the majority of restaurants in each and every casino was owned. Like if you go back to like, you know, think of the 70s, the 80s, maybe even like the early 90s, the majority of the restaurants in each and every casino was owned by them. So the majority of workers back when it was originally named the Culinary Union were culinary employees. Huh, interesting. Well, that uh, explains yeah. it. And then obviously now it's now it's spread to, you know, housekeepers and, you know, everywhere else, but that's, that's why it has that name. Yeah. Re- init- initially, that was their most, the majority of their might have even been at first all of their membership. So anyhow, that's your answer. Go on. So it seems like every time their contract ends, they threaten a strike. So that's why if you've been observing this union and Vegas over the years, you keep hearing about how a strike is coming. It's going to paralyze the strip It's going to be a disaster for tourists checking into hotels and getting housekeeping service and really getting any kind of service. And you're just going to think it's miserable. This most recent, this most recent contract, uh, just so you know, it expired last summer and they've been working basically on a, forget the, the, the wording, but both parties, the way the contract was written, if, both parties did not basically object and there wasn't a new contract in place. The old one would just continue on. So about, I guess, 30 days ago, a month ago, 45 days ago, the union finally gave notice that they were not happy. You know, they were not going to stay with the status quo of not having a new contract. They had to give them notice in writing that they were going to object, which they had to do if they were potentially going to go on a strike. If not, it would violate the contract. They couldn't do it. So, but anyhow, to, to just emphasize the main point, uh, the reason why it seems like the union has leverage now, it wasn't like the timing just happened to be, oh, my God, what a coincidence. They, they literally are about to go on strike. The contract just ended, and, and this big event is a week away. No, the contract ended in June. Uh, they weren't able to come to a, an agreement. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm not in the union. I don't have connections that tell me, you know, well, they met and that they didn't work. I don't know what the agreements were, how many times they tried to, but nothing was finalized. So they basically continued on with an expired contract. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. So they've been working with an expired contract since June. And now, though, and this is smart, if you were the head of the union, you'd do the same thing. Now, they certainly planned it to coincide with this. But but what I'm saying is at the same time, I blame the casinos because they had to know this was coming and they should have bargained stronger or, or you know, gotten on board in January or February like most agreements do, you know, a couple months before they're expired, expired like in sports or any union where, you know, you talk months before, you know, it's going to end. You don't wait until it expires. And you certainly don't wait knowing that this is the most likely outcome. Like they had to know when it expired in June and then July went by and then early August went by, you know, and they never gave them any notice that they were objecting to working without a contract that once they got closer, they were going to use that leverage. I mean, you can't blame them because that's just a smart thing to do. I mean, whether you agree with their ethics or not, you know what I mean? Like that's just what all this is about. Well, I know that's the problem though, is they, 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 they did become too powerful. And then, yeah, you could say the hotels didn't manage this right. And somewhat got themselves into this pickle. Oh, they certainly did. How, they never should have given them that much leverage. Yeah. Now they have no choice. Yeah. But but even when there's no, not a major event coming, no they still, they can't just say, okay, we'll then go on strike because listen to the list of who's in this union. Guest room attendants, cocktail and food servers, 
porters, bellmen, yeah. cooks, bartenders, laundry, and kitchen workers. Good luck running a hotel without that. No, no, no. It would be at a standstill. They have. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's, it's not even a question. Like it'd be at a standstill. Like you need these people. You, I mean, you have to have them. You know, housekeeping, maids, valets, concierge. I mean, it, it's it's a back. It's basically everything but your front end uh, casino employees. And you'd basically have table games dealers and like the slot attendants and you know the people running the casino because none of them are unionized. They never have been in Vegas. And then you'd have the employees of every restaurant that isn't casino owned. And everyone else would be on strike. Yeah, that's that's, that's the problem. Strike. You're, you're, everyone, yeah, everyone. Would. So that's why, even though they have additional yeah. leverage now because of the big event, even when there's not a big event, they don't want everything shutting down because there's always people coming to Vegas. There's there's so many hotels here. There's so many well, rooms they, involved. They, they couldn't take the chance that during this one event is you know that they took the time. I mean, listen, it was a bluff on both parts because they don't they didn't want to hurt their membership and the other thing was they only have enough this article came out today this is the other interesting thing the union only has like eight million eighteen million dollars in reserves which means there's only enough money to pay all the employees if they went on strike each four hundred dollars for the first week and then three hundred dollars for the second and then they'd be out of money and these aren't people that have savings in general. These are usually not the cocktail waitresses and bartenders, of course, but the majority of these employees are, are on the lowest end of the, the totem pole in terms of income in Las Vegas. These aren't people that have savings and keep living and can pay their mortgages. So the leverage kind of goes both ways because the casinos know that, too. So any kind of, any kind of walkout was only going to be like a token walkout, you know, like a week, a couple days, just to prove their point. It, was, it would never be like what happened you know, with the Screen Guild writers in Hollywood or, you know, it would never even, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's never going to get to like eight months, nine months, ten months a year, but it wouldn't even get to like, you know, a month because these poor people, you know, the majority of them are not rich employees that this union protects. They're not. They're the lowest end, like, what do you, restroom attendants, you know, come on, what do you think they make? Porters, you know, nothing, you know, like after taxes and, you know, even even if you look like a maid and you think, okay, or a housekeeper, housekeeper makes eighteen twenty dollars an hour, but after you take out all their deductions, like, you know, all these, for the majority of, of these of these men and women that work these menial, you know, like lower income jobs, they have children, they have health insurance, you know, they have various deductions. They're, they're not making a lot. They're, they're barely getting by. They're, you know, they, they just are. So, um, but anyhow, my opinion of all this, and I'm sorry to, you know, hijack, you can say yours, the casinos definitely should have, you know, foreseen this coming and not let it get to this point where where the union had so much leverage, like right before this was going to happen. Meaning, like if they knew that they were going to go on strike, let them strike at some other point. You know, let them or, or how, you know, however you're going to do it, don't do it when they have all the leverage where you can't even afford a week. You know, walk out because you have this big race coming in. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not going to get into like pro union, anti union, but. If you were, you know, Dan Druff, Todd would tell us, if you were the head of the culinary union or any union, you would have done the same thing, because from a strategic point of view, it was the right move for them to do right now. I well, mean, yeah, I'm not questioning the strategy. Their leadership, I'm just... their leadership would be voted out. You know, they, they just, that was the time. Like, you know, you got, you, they'd be accused of incompetency if they let this moment go by with no contract still since June, and now we're in November, and they didn't use this leverage, because after this, they'll never have this kind of leverage again, you know, that they have right now at this very moment. So, you know. That's the way it is. Yes, yeah, so I don't have an issue. I don't have an issue though with the strategy. You know, the strategy is the strategy, and and of course they can figure out uh, how to get the most leverage. I just think this union is too big and too wide as far as who it encompasses, to where it does give them the power to just completely shut down operation of these hotels. And this is Vegas's main economy, and. It just gives this one union way too much power. And if it were split, if it were a union, you know, one for the housekeepers, you know, one for the the food workers, uh, you know, one for the bellmen and porters, and whatever it is. Part of, right, but that's part of their selling point that, you know, they're, collectively they're too big that they can be bossed around, pushed around, whereas they think if it, if it was broken into pieces, like you said, the casinos would be able to bully them more. That that that's always been the fear of them not of, of you know potentially it being broken up because collectively at one at such a large number they feel like they can take on these corporations and you know what you know we can agree to disagree I think it's kind of a fair trade I mean these you know these casinos are are, are pulling punches too so you know it, it it's a 
you know, they're big corporations that sometimes bully people, and then you have a big union that bullies back. I think it's a fair fight, in other words. That's my opinion. I don't think, I, oh, woe is the big casino that has this big, massive union coming after them. Come on. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see it that way. I see it as a fair fight. I guess that's what I'm saying. I see it as a fair fight. The problem is the only way the casino has any leverage back is what you were saying, that they have to count on that these uh, union members striking won't be able to do it for very long because a lot of them won't and be able to afford they it. Know that. But Right. And I'm not like telling you some secret. They, you know, they know that. The casinos know that they can't last because they can't. You know, like what, what you would, you would, uh, it'd be a massive, you know, we'd have a, uh, another, you know, like a real estate bubble here. You know, I mean, if it got to that point, like what we're seeing in like LA. But, but here's the know, problem. Here's like, the problem. Like, when, 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 pay their bills. I, here's the problem. I'm not going to equate this to the thing going on in Hollywood because that's a different story. They kind of just shut down right. for the most part so when that's right. happening. Yeah. But, but sure. with, with this here, even if it is for a few days, it's it's a complete disaster. E- even if it's only a short-term thing that the strike would take place, it would be a complete disaster for all the tourists that are coming there. The whole thing would just shut down. And in most union models where there's just not complete control of a particular industry, then they they will they can hire some temporary scabs to kind of uh, bridge it over not not to replace the union workers necessarily but to at least make things be able to run while the strike is happening and while they're trying to negotiate something so the whole thing doesn't fall apart but but here if if there was a strike and this has been feared for a long time in fact it was even feared the previous time during the world series of poker that a strike could happen and then it was going to wreak havoc upon the World Series. Not the casino operations, but the hotel operations, and it was going to be absolute hell for anyone coming out to play the World Series. So this shouldn't be something that tourists have to fear, that it, that all these different type of hotel employees would stop working at once. And if you're just having the bad luck to show up when that is, then well, you're okay. fucked. This is, this is the other thing. Okay, and you have to really just realize this before people get so hectic. Do you know the last strike in Las Vegas was? No. 1984. Okay, 1984. It lasted a while. It lasted like six months. Okay, there's like, I think like maybe 16, 17,000 members that went on strike, but it was 1984. Okay, that was a lifetime ago. At this point, Okay, in our realm right now and in, in our current reality, it's just posturing on both sides because neither side can afford it. It's almost like a nuclear war. I know that's a crazy, crazy cliche, cliche to say. But, you know, when I say nuclear war, in the sense that nobody wins. You know, you go on a strike, the culinary union, their members can't pay their bills, they can't feed their kids, they, they can't pay their mortgages, they, they, don't, they don't want it. The casinos come at a standstill, customers are upset especially what happened to MGM. Like MGM had no choice because they're right out, right off that whole hacking thing that just happened, you know, where customers were already, uh, you know, alienated and pissed off. You know, they don't care that it wasn't MGM's fault. They don't care that MGM, you know, wasn't going to pay cyber terrorist money, you know, where Caesars did, you know, they just want to come. They want their room keys to work. They want to be able to use their credit cards, play their slots. You know, they don't care what the reasons are. So that that you know that was a double whammy for them because they just couldn't afford it. But but in essence, what I'm saying is it's just a game of chicken. You know, it, it, neither side could afford whatever the collateral damage, the different various types of collateral damage that a strike would cause. And again, we haven't. You know, you hear this all the time, like you're saying. But in reality, there, the, the the last time there was a strike was 40 years ago, and that's a totally different world. 40 years ago, there weren't as many properties. Things weren't the way they are now. Like, yeah, it would have sucked 40 years ago, or I'm sure it sucked 40 years ago too. But it no nowhere near created the impasse forty years ago that it would create in, a, in modern day Vegas. But the point I'm saying is, I don't think that you and I will ever live to see a massive, you know, even I won't even say long term, even like semi long term, semi medium term type strike here because neither side could afford it. And again, it's been forty years; it only happened once. And you know, back then, if you look like. You know, I know you're probably, or I think, you know, you're kind of anti-union in some ways, but if you look at, like, what the salaries were and the changes that were implemented after that strike, it had to kind of be done. Like, it, it kind of created 
the environment that we're in now where, where certain employees, certain union employees can work in Las Vegas and make a decent income and have some of their rights protected. Like it put the framework that is basically what that strike in 84 put the framework you know, down, which is basically still in place today. So, um, but the point I'm making again is it's a game of chicken. You know, they were never going to go on strike. Okay. And, and, and the, the city and the, the casinos were never going to let them go on strike. It just was posturing, you know, it just was posturing. It just can't happen. It's just one of those things where it can't happen, you know, especially because of what happened, as I said, with MGM, there was no way after all that happened, they were going to have another fail where massive, you know, high rollers and customers were going to come in and they were not going to get the service that they were used to. No way. Just no chance. It just couldn't happen. Just couldn't happen. No, it's, it's, I'm sure that's true. Do about nothing. It's media. It's media hysteria. It's you know this the shock. Oh my God! There's been, it this was never going to happen. It never was. You know. And now, obviously, duh. You know they came to an agreement. Like you hear all this build up five days ago. This is, it could be a strike. This is a date. This is a date. Never going to happen. I would have bet you anything you want to bet. There's no chance of it happening, and it's not going to happen. So I thought that too. I also have been observing that there's all this hysteria that a strike's going to happen and then it never does. They always come to an agreement. But I think part of that reason or a big part of the reason is because the hotels know they just can't, they just, they, they hold out as long as they can and, and try to act strong. But in reality, they know that they're going to have to make a deal. They're going to have to give in with some things. And that does just, I feel gives the union too much power. But anyway, let me tell you what's uh, supposedly been agreed to. Just uh, this probably isn't the whole thing. I'm sure it's not. But uh, Vital Vegas put out, and he pretty confidently put it out that he's pretty certain that this is a fact, though it hasn't been officially stated anywhere. He wrote, "Culinary union members will get the biggest bump in Vegas history," referring to the salaries. Big winners are housekeepers and other non-tipped workers. They'll get about a 15% increase in year one of a five-year contract, more than the total increase over the last five years combined, retroactive to June. Now, this by itself isn't a big deal, like as far as something I'd object to, because there's been big-time inflation since COVID, and that has changed everything as far as what's a fair salary, because the dollar can buy much less than it used to. So even since like 2019, there's been like 24% inflation, which is crappy. So we didn't used to have that type of inflation for many, many years. I know in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of inflation, especially the 70s. But since then, since the 90s started, the inflation has been pretty slow. And now it's uh, rocketing up. So it makes sense to give a 15% increase if they're wasn't that much of an increase over the past five years combined. He said that this is more than the total increase over that time. So, yeah, if over the last five years they've been increased less than 15% and inflation has been more than that, which it has, then, yes, they are making more or they're making less money inflation adjusted than they were five years ago. And, yeah, that's fair to adjust that. The non-tipped workers getting this, getting the biggest increase is actually something I support because I've long maintained that the tipped workers are overpaid, as I was saying before, and the non-tipped workers are underpaid. I always like to bring this up at casinos where people will talk about, oh, you know, you, ha- you have to tip generously here, you have to tip generously there, this is where the, the, they make their money, they're making minimum wage otherwise. And I say, well, now forget what they're making as the base salary. Look at what they're typically taking home. And if they are taking home something that's very good for the type of work they're doing, then you got to look at the other employees around there, the ones who are cleaning the bathrooms, the housekeepers, and just various other non-tipped employees. They're making peanuts. And they're, in some cases, doing a much harder job. And a lot of times the tipped positions are not positions where you need a lot of education or training. So... I've always found that to be unfair, and if they're trying to do this to make things... The whole system, I a bit unfair, but it's just we're too accustomed to the to the process and the model that it's ever going to change. Oh, I know that. You know but, what I mean? Yeah, but I'm just saying it's, that, it's, that, uh, well. that, that it makes sense that they're trying to make things better first for the non-tipped employees, and that's good, and I, I would support that. 
my my biggest problem with unions in general i'm not talking about this one where i have the additional problem that they're too big and too powerful my biggest problem is that it's too hard to get rid of bad employees there's too many protections for employees that are bad it's basically an overcorrection of companies trying to let go of people who are wait are you saying that are you saying vegas specifically or unions no unions in general that oh yeah right okay. yeah, that uh, it's an overcorrection because uh, the fear originally when I say originally I mean you know you go way way back a hundred years or so the fear originally would be that uh, they'll purposely find excuses to fire employees who have been there a long time if they feel are getting old or just if they feel are making too much money get rid of them and replace them with young people who are willing to take much less. And it screws these older people who then have a hard time getting another job. So this is like job security. And that without that job security, then these greedy corporations are going to find petty reasons to let these people go. The problem is a lot of times with these noble, original intents, it gets converted into something very bad. It morphs into something that's not what was intended. So... The problem, and I'm talking about with unions everywhere, not just uh, this one. The problem is it just becomes very, very difficult to remove any employee who's been there a long time. Anyone who has seniority is very, very difficult to fire. And when I say very difficult to fire, I mean really, really difficult to fire. So you can have these just really lousy employees, but as long as they show up to work every day, kind of generally do the job and don't do anything illegal then it's very hard to get rid of them. And I've seen this in places, even like the supermarket, that you know, some supermarkets that have union employees. And you'll see someone with a badge on, uh, you know, serving you since 1984. There's a very good chance that person is going to have a very bad attitude. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can complain to the manager. Nothing can be done. And I've seen it. I've experienced it. And I'm not there, like, picking fights or being rude myself. Like, you just get a really bad attitude from those people, and then you'll go to a place that's not union, and you don't see this. So, this can be a big problem, and these unions don't seem to have any desire to reform this either. This could be reformed, but it's not. So, there's just this protection of those that have seniority, and it hurts consumers, and it just makes everything crappy. You really need the ability to fire bad workers, to fire disrespectful workers. And you can't have your hands tied to not be able to do that, except in extreme situations where you can really, really, really prove you need to let them go. So uh, that's one of my biggest problems with unions. But I, I, I could go on all day about this. But that that's really where my main problem is. The, the compensation part of it, uh, sometimes I do feel that they ask for too much and, and get too much. And they also can be too powerful sometimes from a political standpoint, especially some of these uh, public labor unions, which I feel should not exist at all. But, you know, that's a whole different topic of conversation. So I feel, you know, I feel like I said that, you know, you're right. The unions have gotten powerful, but, but each and every year, these corporations have become more and more powerful. So I think it's an even matchup, you know, let them duke it out. And I mean, you know what I mean? You can't have sympathy for these big, comp- these big companies. They're going to try to they're going to try to nickel and dime the union as best as they can because their job is to maximize profit. The union's job, you know, maximize what their employees make. Their job, you know, it's just it's back and forth. Who's smarter? Who has more leverage? Who has more you know business acumen to you know sign a better contract? It's it's you know it's cutthroat. I mean, it is. But don't think for a second that these corporations wouldn't you know make the union sign a bad deal if they could to increase their profit. You know what I mean? It, it's both sides trying to just get the best advantage. I mean, no, I, I'm not. You know, I'm not defending the corporations here, or saying that they're existing for the people's interest. They're obviously not. I'm just saying that in this particular case, I think it's too big and powerful. And I, I also think just unions in general. The the biggest issue I have with them is the very difficult process to fire anyone who's bad. So that uh, that really yeah. is my main issue but let's uh do you have well, any but then you have to realize uh, realize at some point those casinos signed you know contracts with them to include those various provisions that was their choice no one forced their hand like 
at some point, at whatever point that started. You know what I mean? Like it, it you know, they, they made a choice to do that. And I agree. Like that, that is the worst part of it where you see employees, you know, sometimes, you know, cocktail waitresses, whatever it be, that may act rude or any employee, but I just said cocktail waitress, that, you know, act, they act entitled or you can just tell they, you know, take their job for granted or they're disrespectful customers because you have to believe they think they're untouchable. So, like, that is a bad version of it. But then at the same time in the world we live in with, you know, sexual harassment being, you know, prevalent and, you know, corruption and all these other things, it probably has, you know, or it definitely has protected a number of employees over the years that otherwise might might have been treated poorly, you know, incorrectly or, you know, convicted of something, you know, that they didn't do or fired, you know, unjustly. You know what I mean? It goes both ways. It goes both ways, but I, I just feel that it's an overcorrection. That whatever they're correcting, they're they're getting maybe a much worse uh, situation on the other end. It's yeah. one of these things where the cure is worse than than the disease. And by the way, I was wrong. I, you know, I, I just I'm going off my memory. I, I looked while we were talking. The last strike, as I mentioned, that was in '84, lasted 67 days. And I'm reading an article from like one of the news channels that covered it. There's not like a Wikipedia on it, and it said it cost Las Vegas those 67 days. Uh, over a hundred million dollars, and I, I what I was looking for is that eighty four dollars, or is that nineteen eighty four dollars, or is that what it would be today? Doesn't say, so I have to assume it's eighty four dollars. But sixty seven days, it cost them a hundred million. Imagine what that would be today. You know, sixty seven days. Yeah, probably. Be, well, um, it, it, just the inflation adjusted is probably like three hundred million. Right. But either way, it's one of those things. Like I said, it really. You know, I didn't think at first it was the best comparison. But the nuclear war analogy, I think it's perfect because it really is a thing, a, a comparison where, there, you know, there'd be no winners. Neither side could afford it. You know what I mean? It would devastate the casinos. It would devastate the union members, too. It's just neither side. I mean, you know, they could, as I said, the worst case scenario ever that we'll see is they just want to prove their point and there is some kind of brief walkout. But anything, you know, longer than that, it just can't happen. Like, you know, they just they couldn't sustain themselves. Yeah. You know, they just couldn't. You know, and then the, 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 just to close out, you know, everything, I totally agree. And I've always agreed that the uh, equality is so out of skew here. Like, you know, what cocktail waitresses make, bartenders versus like, you know, it's just night and day. It's like one extreme to the other. But, you know, and I've thought about it and you could think about it. I'm sure other people have thought about it. There really isn't any equitable way to kind of bridge the gap. Like too many people are making, you know, what would, way too much money whereas other people that work really 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 hard as well you might even argue they work harder than you know than than a lot of the other people in the same union are, are making way less and it's not like there's a difference in like these skilled positions where like oh you know you could say well a doctor went to college and you know none of these people for the most part you know had any sort of formal training you know what i mean like there wasn't you know yeah that's what i was saying me. there's a major inequity there and not a college for yeah yeah so, like, you know, I mean, listen, I, you know, I was a dealer. I've worked in the casino business. I'm not, I'm not, you know, belittling anyone, you know, and I get it all. But it, it doesn't seem right that dealers, you know, at certain high-end properties like the Wynn literally are making over 100000 a year, where porters are making, you know, twenty five, thirty thousand 30000 at most. You know, it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't seem right. But I, there's no, I can't think of a solution. Somebody would have to give up money. You know, it also doesn't seem right that a lot of these positions, the casino don't doesn't take some of the burden and pay these employees and puts the burden on, you know, the customer. But then again, then you could just translate that to all of society, where that's just a problem where the businesses don't want to pay and they're putting that burden, you know, on employees. Oh, well, if you don't tip, then, you know, the employees can't eat. They can't feed their kids. They can't buy milk. They put the burden on the customer, and that's, you know, that's everywhere. And that's a whole other issue, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere and, Every so often it gets brought into the mainstream and people say, well, why can't we have, you know, the same system that's in Europe and, and it works in Europe, the non-tipping and, you know, and I don't know the answer. Well, how does it work in Europe but it can't work here? Like, well, yeah, it, it should. And, and that's, I, I, I'm not a big defender of Europe and the way they do things. There's a lot of things Europe does that I don't like. But uh, the two things I do like from Europe is that they've just done away with this tipping culture there's barely any of it and where it is it's reasonable and then they just pay people fairly for the job they're doing and then the other thing is that the consumer protections are much better there there's a lot of consumer and data privacy protections over there 
that don't exist yeah. in the United right. States, and I wish we had here. So that's uh, those are, those are I mean, things that... You can't that even sell an iPhone without a charger there if not you're going to court and Apple's paying, like, you know, a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you can't... You have to, like, put a charger in your, you know, or, like, a certain universal USB... I don't know. There's some big thing with Apple with the iPhones with chargers and USB cords where there's a big, massive, massive settlement that Apple just had to pay. You know, and they've gone after Microsoft. You're right about the consumer protection. Well, and, and even... I, even you know, uh, yeah, yeah, and and like along the line with the tipping, like those cruise lines cannot compel anyone to do mandatory gratuities, which are fake gratuities anyway. They're not even real tips. Those can't be done in Europe. They they uh, they are not allowed to charge them. So th- without that, going into a whole big thing about it, can you explain to me why it works so well in Europe, but people say here it doesn't work? The non-tipping. It, it, it could work. Yeah. They, they, we it's just got to break the system. Huh? It could work. We just have to break the system. Everyone's so used to the system here that no one is is changing it. It would require a mass effort to change where everybody kind of agrees at once to change it, and it just isn't changing. We're just entrenched in this stupid system, whereas in Europe, that system didn't exist in the first place. So in Europe, they just d- didn't have this tipping culture and you didn't have this situation where a lot of these service jobs devolved into being tip supported where they get paid minimum wage and and the burdens on the customers to pay most of like, their salaries you know the one thing the one thing that's always irked me and i'm not cheap by any means you know i mean i'm not i'm not you know i wouldn't say like i'm insane generous but i'm like i'm above average for sure but you know I, it's not like i'm some uber rich person that could leave 40% tips my whole life. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I, I'm, I'm above what I guess the average person would be. But what's always irked me, and I, you know, I hope I'm not pissing a lot of people off. I'm just being honest in, in my thoughts here. You have a guy, or you have, okay, well, you know, I just say a woman. It doesn't matter. But you have, okay, you have a person that works at the Black Bear Diner. And that's like, a, you know, a, a, it's a little chain here that uh, I think there's three of them in Las Vegas. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. It's like a coffee shop, basically. And, I, you know, I go there once in a while for breakfast, and you see the servers, you know, running around. Like, you know, they're, they're sometimes, especially during the summer, you know, they're sweating, and they're just busting their ass, okay? Then you see a server at Joe's Stone Crab, where I like to eat a couple times a year at Caesars, okay? They're both working as hard. Sometimes even, you know, the, the server at Black Bear Diner is working harder, you know, but they're both working hard, okay? They're both serving plates of food, why would one literally get 2,000% more for doing the same job only because the food is more expensive that they're bringing you? It just doesn't make sense because the plate they're bringing you has an expensive stone crab on it versus a thing of eggs and potatoes. They're going to get 2,000% more? Yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah. I've always said if, yeah. if, if you are, are looking to be generous when you're tipping in a restaurant, what you should do is you should do it in the cheaper places. You should leave a high percentage in the cheaper places and a lower percentage in the higher end places. And the funny thing is a lot of people treat it differently. A lot of people say, oh, I'm in a higher end place. I have to tip uh, you know, 25% here. I go, no, 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 it's the opposite. You should tip, you should tip less in these places because yeah, they're making so much. I never thought of that. That's a great idea. That really is. That really, that really is. So, and, and that's what I, I often will do. My two people that are doing the same job, both working hard, why is there such a disparity? There shouldn't be. Yeah, it's really just one of these be. weird inequities, and, and uh, yeah, I, I've talked about this before, so uh, Europe definitely does this better, and I, I don't want to see these people making minimum wage. I just want to see them making a fair wage and, and not have it be based upon this weird arbitrary tipping system. But, all right, it's getting very late here. Let me move on. Do you yeah. want to stay on, or I'll do you want one more? I'll do one more. Okay. Is this is this a poker one? Is this a poker? This thing? is a video poker one. That one. Y- I'm gonna yeah, go. you suggest. I think this is gonna be the end for me too. I think I'm gonna table everything else. There's not much more left anyway. Okay. Brandon actually brought this to my attention, so this is definitely a topic he knows about because he actually brought it to me. I wasn't aware of it until yesterday. Well, the funny thing is, you were because we talked about it like a year ago when it came out. And I just don't think you paid much attention or maybe you meant to research it, but I did tell you about it a while ago. That's why it was on my radar. But anyhow, this is the first time you in depth looked at it. I might have just mentioned it in passing and you didn't pick up on it or maybe I didn't explain it as well as I did today. But anyhow, it's not that new. I mean, it's relatively new. Yeah, it's, it's about two years old. 
Yeah, correct. I'm not bringing you a new story, as Brandon just said, but this is very interesting to me. And it was something I wasn't even aware could be done because what I had believed, and I guess was the case until 2021, regarding video poker in casinos was that they didn't have a way to differentiate whether you were a good or bad player, at least not in the short term, because results are all over the place. You can make a lot of mistakes and then just hit some big hands, you know, you hit a royal flush, you hit some four of a kinds, whatever, and, and all of a sudden you've, you've had a big winning session. I mean, when the, you... variance can kind of be, the variance can be off the wall. Yes. It's, so you know, In terms of, you could be a bad player, but just run well and look like you're okay, whereas you could also be a, yeah, a good player and run bad and basically be in the same group as a bad player that just has run better. Yes. So, so, more, yeah, right. so I, I told a story to Brandon about someone I knew, and this story goes about you know, maybe eight years ago, but I knew someone who barely ran any play at a casino and just got their ass kicked at video poker, you know, ran maybe about $4,500 worth of credits through, which is very little, and then quit in frustration and they lost like 1500 bucks. So they they got like a 67% return, which is horrible on video poker, which is, you know, returning in the high 90s. So they just ran really awful short term and just quit. And then they started getting these fairly big offers that they didn't expect given the very little play they put in. And this was on a new card, so that helped, but uh I theorized then that their results were so bad that the computer that was analyzing this probably thought that this person was a massive video poker fish and not just that they ran unusually bad in that short term one session they did. So that's probably why they were given such offers is that they lost so much so quickly and the computer thought, hey, how could this person lose a third of their money cycling through in video poker? Like the, They must be awful, but that wasn't the case here. So they got offers that were uh, much better than they expected, which uh, was a pleasant surprise to them. So I was telling him this story, and uh, then he told me about this video poker analyzer that casinos could buy, because I was explaining that uh, the casino incorrectly rated this person probably based on their very short-term results on their first video poker session. So apparently casinos do, or at least can, have the technology to be able to analyze the actual play, not the results, but the actual play at video poker and see who's a good player, who's an okay player, and who's a bad player. And then, of course, the casinos will want to do more to invite the bad players back. Now, even the good players are still technically negative EV, except on these very rare games, which are over 100% return. But they're really not looking to market to the perfect strategy player who selects the best pay tables and uh, just overall doesn't uh, give a lot of money to the casino. They're looking to bring in the fish who are just going to lose most times they play because they're just choosing all the wrong strategies. So in 2021, in the middle of 2021, a company called Acres Manufacturing Company put out a press release that said this. Acres Manufacturing Today announced the launch of Optimal Poker Analyzer, a software application that allows casinos to maximize profit on video poker. The program applies advanced analytics from Acres Manufacturing's newly launched Foundation Casino Management System to evaluate every decision made in video poker, enabling casinos to strategically optimize marketing and operations. And then it says... Optimal Poker Analyzer works by interfacing to Acres Manufacturing Foundation's casino management system, which provides granular data on every hand played. Accessing the actual card values as they're dealt, Optimal Poker Analyzer instantly recognizes the optimal play strategy of each hand and grades the player's actual in-hand decision as a deviation from the expected return of the optimal strategy. Now, let me stop here and explain what that means. They're saying that with each hand anyone plays... It will look at what they should do if they're playing correctly and what they actually do. So if they play it correctly, then it doesn't really make any adjustment to what the expected return is from the machine. But if the player makes a mistake, then it says, oh, well, this is a 3% mistake. So 
we're going to figure that into the expected return. So it's not calculating what the person actually wins, you know, whether they get a lucky draw or unlucky draw. They're calculating what the expected return is given completely average luck, which is what the casinos like to calculate, given how good this player is. Because before, casinos would calculate what your theoretical loss was based upon having exactly average luck and playing perfectly. And sometimes they'll subtract a little bit from that since very few people can play perfectly. But they're they're kind of ballparking it and kind of putting everybody in the same boat, which isn't what they do with with other games, like table games, like blackjack. They'll actually rate someone's skill and they'll offer them different things based upon what their skill is. In video poker, for the most part, they don't. Now, as I said, that one person from eight years ago, I think that is what happened, but that was only very short term and they were a very big outlier because of how badly they ran. But for the most part... They're just generating a theoretical loss for the player based upon the return of the machine at perfect play or perfect play minus some fixed amount that they figure that the average person will make a few mistakes. So this is not assuming anything. This actually figures out the theoretical return of the machine based on average play for or you know, based on average luck for perfect play and then subtracts from that for the player when they make mistakes. So after getting enough data on a particular player, they can figure out what they can expect to win from that player every time they play video poker. And it's different for each player based on their skill level. And that was a capability they didn't have before. Because before, at best, all they could do was analyze a player's results and try to draw conclusions from that. But they couldn't see if they're actually making the right plays and if they're success or lack thereof is due to luck or skill. There was no way to tell this until they got a lot of hands in and then the the variance would flatten out. But that can take a long time in video poker where you could run uh, well for a while or run badly for a while and uh, it can take a while to actually be showing the return that would be expected from your level of play. So here it's analyzing it in real time. The press release goes on to say Video poker is a staple in the casino industry, specifically in the high-frequency local markets like Nevada. Due to the skill factor involved, highly skilled players, known as advantage players, are able to achieve a positive expected return that causes casinos to lose money. Now, that's not directly true. There's very few machines where you can do that. But what they're probably referring to is that these players can combine the relatively low level of losses versus the comps they're going to get and turned it into a positive situation. That's basically what they're saying without directly describing all that. Those losses are increased when factoring in marketing offers such as free play or other rewards that are designed to incentivize play. Now, that's, no, that's, that's what causes the losses. They're a little bit wrong on that one. Many casinos have responded by adapting their video poker strategy by reducing the number of games and incentives offers. They're basically saying here, guys, you don't have to keep lowering your comps because you're afraid advantage players are going to manipulate the system and play just enough to get the best offers and then milk you with free play and then bounce. That you don't have to worry about this now. What you can just do is analyze everybody's play and we'll tell you who the bad players are. Now, by the way, this is not going to solve the advantage player issue because when the advantage players see this happening, they can, when they get a new card, they can purposely play really badly and take an additional loss in those sessions, knowing that they're going to get big offers from the casino within a few months and then milk it that way. So they're not as clever as they think. So this isn't really a, a tool to stop advantage players. This is more something to identify who the fish are. Like, if you have somebody that is just not playing very uh, strong strategy and is giving up extra percentage points to the casino for that reason, and you're analyzing all of their hands, and it, this just seems to be what they're doing, and especially when you're, you're giving them offers in free play and they're continuing to do that, and then you analyze, and there's no way this could be positive expectation. There's no way they're an advantage player. Then you, you can start uh, feeling confident about offering generous comps to these people. 
especially because a lot of these people tend to be problem gamblers who will just keep gambling till they're broke or till at least they're broke with what they brought with them. So that's exactly who they want on property, who the people who, aside from hitting some huge jackpot that they're not going to hit very often, they're just going to grind themselves down even if they have some temporary luck. And if their skill is bad enough, then it's pretty inevitable it's going to happen quickly. So that's exactly who they want here. And it takes a lot of the guesswork out of just analyzing results without enough data points. So I had no idea that such a thing existed. I do know that video poker will have a memory of the hands that have been run. I've seen it where they can go back and look at each hand run. I didn't know if that memory corresponded to any particular player's card. I I just knew the machine had a memory. I didn't know if it could save all the hands to a particular card, but I guess it must have this capability. And then on top of that, they're now offering a tool which can analyze this and present a report to the casino. Okay, here's the bad players. Here's the okay players. Here's the good players. It says, approved for use in Nevada and other major jurisdictions. Optimal Poker Analyzer worked on any game with Foundation installed, which is their other product, and across all variants of video poker, Foundation does not require a floor-wide install, meaning that uh, this Foundation package can be put on only particular machines if people want, if, if casino managers want. So that is interesting. And it's been around now for two and a half years. But apparently this is being used in some places in Vegas. I don't know which ones. It's well, they're never going to release it. They're never going to release it or clients are. Yeah. You know what? Let me ask you something. Uh, when I first moved here, you know, guys like Bob Dancer and, and, you know, there was a big segment of gamblers. Or I shouldn't say big, but there was a segment of gamblers that only played video poker. They loved video poker. And they were able to play games that when you included comps and promotions and gifts, and, you know, these are people that obviously played it either flawless or close to it, that they were able to get a positive expectation out of, you know, playing video poker. Uh, You know, not not short term, of course, but, you know, over the long term, year after year when enough hands were played. Uh, infamously, we remember, I don't know what year it was, but somewhere around 2008 or nine, when Caesars started 86ing players that were doing similar there, that were winning either, either lifetime winners or, you know, close to it with the comps on video poker. Remember, uh, when, uh, what's his name? Uh, Microsoft. Yeah. Richard Brody got banned. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Was one of the guys that got banned and he objected cause he, you know, he was fine, you know, with, with, with the gambling part of it but he wanted to still be able to play poker and they overturned it all right so anyhow that you know that was a long time ago uh in today's day and age in today's climate with today's machines and the way casinos are is it still even possible with comps and and the gifts and just maximizing everything to turn a profit playing video poker or are they not enough beatable pay scales versus the fact that you know you're not getting comp is it question obviously is it beatable is it, is it even in, in some ways it is come up yeah in, in some places it is um th- there's various tricks that can be used that i won't go into but th- there are some ways to manage it in some places there's also a lot of variance to it and there are very few machines now that are over 100 percent return with perfect play and well, often I ask you are you talking about the strip or are you talking about having to go to like downtown? No, because downtown it's problem? no, because it's, those are very low limits anyway. So you're not going to make much there, and the return is like a tiny bit over a hundred, and you have to play perfect, and it's it's just not worth doing. So you can still find on the strip at, at some properties machines that are better that, that the payback skills are decent enough to turn a profit over the long run, unless you're really smart with how you generate the offers that are going to come to you. No. Uh, and it's mainly because they've degraded pay well, tables. I mean. I'm just talking about playing. I'm talking about being, you know, playing straight up, going there with your card, you know, maximizing everything, but not doing anything that might be a gray area. I mean, just playing legit straight up. Yeah, because they've lowered the pay tables enough to where, at most well, limits, you're just right. not going to be able to uh, lose a small amount enough to where the comps can overcome that. Now, as I said, there are s- smart ways to 
get around that in some places, and I, I won't get into the whole thing. And in fact, uh, some people wouldn't be happy with me if I did. So uh, I'm not. Go- I'm not going to. You know, there's only some things I can say. But uh, you know, there are ways to do it. But it's not somewhere you. You can't do this everywhere. You can't just pick a casino and say, okay, I'm going to beat this casino with video poker. I know how to do it. Like, there's just uh, some places it's not, just not possible. There's other places where it's possible, but you're only going to have uh, a small expected profit and a lot of variance, so it's probably not worth doing. And it, it's not as simple as it used to be where you just go in and play 9-6 jacks or better and make sure not to make mistakes and then just expect you're going to get generous comps that are going to easily overcome the 0.46% house edge on it. it. It's not that simple anymore. And that, that's basically what Richard Brody was doing, is he was playing something like 9-6 jacks, and he was playing at a you know, fairly high limit. I don't know how high, but you know, it wasn't playing super high, but he was playing fairly high and, and just playing well, and then they just saw he's putting in a lot of coin in, so they're giving him nice comps, and then at some point they realize that he's just someone who overall is taking money from them. Not a lot of money, but they they, they banned him, yeah, seeing him as an advantage player. And he basically said, "I'm not. You know, I'm just coming in and playing your video poker and playing it well. Like I'm not an advantage player. I'm just playing it the the way that you're supposed to play and making the right decisions. And you guys are deciding what to comp me. And uh, now I can't play the World Series of Poker, and this sucks. And fortunately, because he had somewhat of a following back then." He got a lot of people on his side that were yelling at Caesars over this, and they reversed the decision so he could continue playing the World Series, which, ironically, now he doesn't even play anymore. He, he doesn't seem to play much poker anymore. Let me ask you this. So, when I don't see a lot of it anymore, but when I remember, you know, years ago, there used to be advertisements, even sometimes banks of them with, like, you know, LED lights and signs. When they would advertise 100 point one percent payback or you know whatever it is obviously that's with perfect play what kind of a game was that like you know what version what pay table was it that a game could be over a hundred percent there would be like like a 10 7 double double bonus poker that's what i'm okay take a 10 7 that would be yeah yeah so it was things like that are they are they they games even at the lowest limits like that anywhere in las vegas anymore yeah there's a few downtown but the limits aren't very high. The edge is very small. There's a lot of variance, and it's something like double double bonus, which is pretty tough to play perfectly. So there's a ten seven. If I went out now or whatever, sometime there is a ten seven I could find somewhere. Some pl- casino is, ha- is offering that. I, I haven't looked recently, so um, but I, I did see it just interesting some time ago. It was the, the limits were low, so it you weren't going to get anything out of it. I've never seen a ten seven in my life anywhere. Well, I mean, not that I knew of. I've never okay, seen so I, I found some right here at at, Bo- at Boulder Station. They have a ten six, which is very barely positive EV, double double bonus. They have a Deuces Wild game that's twenty five cents, but it is one hundred point fifteen percent return. And then they have a double what, what bonus. Game, what, game, what game is that? What game is that's, that's, that's a de- Deuces Wild. And then they have a 100.17% return double bonus. Not double double bonus, but just double bonus, which is 10 7. And why is double double bonus? You said that a couple times. Why is it so hard to play perfectly? There, there's a lot of non intuitive adjustments you have to make for various situations that aren't obvious until you memorize them. So if you Google double double bonus poker strategy, and you look, you'll see there's all kinds of things that are not easy to uh, remember. What hands are better than others if you're, g- you're going to hold or you know, one over the other. So I'm not saying it's impossible to learn. It's just not as intuitive yeah, as it is. Today's day and age, with everyone having a smartphone and the Internet, couldn't one sit there and just tabulate in their phone or, or some sort of app? all the hands that they were quest- that were questionable, and yet so they played perfect anyways? Well, yes, but you have to do this, and it's a pain in the ass, and especially at low limits, who's going to want to? And then second, the strategy actually becomes more and more complicated if you really want perfect play. So there's strategies that are like basic, intermediate, advanced, and th- the difference between them is how intricate they get as far as decisions you make 
where there's a lot of additional things to consider for a tiny difference in the edge. And for the most part, people don't bother with that. There's just not enough money involved because some of these things are rare. Do you think video poker is possibly, you know, I guess another silly cliche or analogy, the 2023 or the 2020s version of Limit Hold'em in the sense that it's a dying game? Because, I, you know, now that I think more about it, when I go out, whether it's the Strip, especially the Strip, but also even local places, it seems the shift has been more, especially with the younger generation, to these new, you know, video, like, type slots with the big screens and the bonuses versus, you know, video poker. I, I guess what I'm saying is, do you feel as if the, old, the older generation, of you know, the generation that was... You know, in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the 80s and 90s that, that, you know, made video poker prevalent or dying out and in the sense that maybe like in 20 years it's going to be close to an obsolete game in the casino. Yeah, and, 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 and video poker things? banks are disappearing and being replaced by slot machines and other machines that they feel will get more action. And definitely it's an older person's game. You, you know, if you think about video poker when you walk by it, how often do you see people who are uh, 25 years old, 30 years old playing it? You don't see it very often. It is mainly middle aged and older people time, playing. The only time you really used to would be people sitting at a bar playing it. Too, yeah. Because it, it was a machine. But now most of those machines have slots on them as well, which is smart, obviously, the casinos to do that. So, you know, by, by choice, by force, whatever you want to call it, you used to have to play those games if you want to sit at a bar and gamble. Whereas now, it, you know, there really isn't a need to. So, anyhow, it's just an interesting thing. I really wonder if it's a game. You know, I don't know the numbers. I'm, I'm sure they're not even released anywhere. But if they were, I would be pretty confident that you know, their year year after year numbers are probably down every single year. Like in terms of the play, the coin in, the number of machines, even in casinos. You know what I mean? Like it, it's not. It's becoming more and more irrelevant. It seems every year. I, I think. I think even the space. You know what? You know what? Like think about like twenty years ago when you'd walk into a casino, there'd be a considerable amount of casino space just dedicated to video poker. You don't see that as much anymore. Like, think about that. You really don't. You don't. You see these little areas that have them, but the, it seems like more and more the majority of, of the machines are the, the real machines. You know, reels, not video poker. Yeah. So, just kind of interesting to think about. And, you know, think about how many people that are, like, in their 20s and early 30s or have taken up the, 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 the game and are playing it. You know, like you said, it's an older person's game. You know, now. Because the generation that grew up with it is getting older. You know? It's kind of almost like what, ha- what happened to Kino. Remember, like every place used to have a Kino room. Yeah, people yeah. Used to love Kino, and that and that kind of that 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 uh, you know era of people, that crowd, that generation is is for the most part gone now, or they're older and you know they just gave it up. But I mean, I can think. I think there's one room that has a Kino. I know Red, maybe it's not even there anymore, but I know like Red Rock had a you know like the little room where you could sit a lounge and the balls pop up live. I don't. I'm trying to think. You know, I remember when, when you remember this when we were kids. You know, like the first gambling I ever did in Vegas is probably the same for you. When I used to come here in the '80s, was we go to a restaurant and like we go to the Sands, we go to Desert Inn, we go to Dunes, and every restaurant, maybe not like the like the finest restaurant in the, in the facility, you know, like the steakhouse or you know whatever the hot, most highest end was, but every other restaurant had a kino board in every single room. And there'd be a Kino runner that would come in. I remember when I moved here. Yes, clothes. I remember all those. <laughs> and I remember my parents. My parents would like you know there'd be a crayon on the table. That's what it was. It was a crayon because you you know that's really weird. They never used pens. Remember there were always crayons and there were these just sheets and sheets of these empty Kino cards and it would tell you like there's always like that one million dollar ticket. You had to get like twenty out of twenty or whatever and you do it. You fill it out and you know my parents would would you know, or grandparents if I was with them would hand it to the Kino runner. And give them like a dollar, you know, or five dollars for five games, and I would play. And my whole meal, I would just be enthused. I wouldn't even care what I was eating. I wouldn't care. The, my main objective, my main concentration, would be looking at those numbers each game. And I loved it. I loved it. And if you think about it, it was like the cheapest form of gambling, like five dollars for like thirty minutes. You know what I mean, or whatever it was. You know, dollar a game. That's all we would bet. Now you, you could bet more, but you could bet. You know, maybe you could even bet fifty cents. Back. But you know what I'm saying. And that game is like gone. Like, I mean, just within, you know, less than a generation, it went from being in every casino within the restaurants, and it's gone. Like, it's not, you, you can't even find it anymore. 
So it just makes you think if that, and there, you know, it's funny. I remember like my grandparents and even my great, great, my great, great grand, my great grandfather, like they would come and that was one of the favorite things they would do in Vegas. They love playing Kino. They, they'd sit in the lounges all day. They, you know, they'd smoke a cigar, you know, the, the grandparents, great grandfather, you know, they'd order a drink and that was like, they love it. They love Kino, you know, like now that that generation is gone, that game is gone. I'm kind of wondering if that's a, a fair comparison for like video poker in the sense that in 20 years, video poker will be on the outs like Kino was. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it needs less of a structure to serve the people because you don't need humans to run it for the most part. It, it basically runs itself. But I know what you're saying, that this is something that is dying out as people get older and die, and the younger generations replacing them just don't have much of an interest in it. So yeah, I, you're definitely on to something there. Yeah. You know what else is really interesting? And I'm just, you know, I should because I care about it and it interests me and I find it really, really, you know, just unique. But I'm not really, I realize now, I'm not really as up to date with technology as I wish I was or I should be. So I walked in the other day to the Gold Coast and I haven't been there in forever. There is now a way. And I, I can't believe every casino hasn't implemented this. Maybe they have and I don't even know. But anyhow, walk into the Gold Coast, and they have a system in place. I think, or I shouldn't even say the Gold Coast. It was the Gold Coast, but it's Boyd Gaming that has it. So, you know, that'd be Orleans, Samstown, uh, Suncoast, uh, you know, number of properties downtown, Fremont. Um, anyhow, so walked into the Gold Coast, and now they have a system in place. They have a technology where you don't even need to have your player's card on you. You don't need to print it. You play a slot machine. You go to a setting on your phone. And the slot machine registers with your with the app, with your player's card app on your phone and starts tracking you in real time on your phone without putting a card in the machine. Did you know this existed? No, I didn't know that existed, but it makes sense that they could do this. It does, right, right. But I never even knew, and it's there. Like, it's up and running. It's not like some beta thing. So, you know, you don't have a player's card. You left it at home. You don't want to be bothered with it. Now, I guess the only thing would be it's draining your phone to some degree, and that might get a little a little old. But I don't even know how much it drains. It well, also, your fo- what if your phone just dies? Then what do you do? Yeah, yeah. But you don't even need a card. You know, I mean, you don't, I couldn't believe it. Like, it, it was like tethering or whatever the term is. From my app to the actual machine I was on, you had to, like, type in, like, a pin to, like, can, you know, to, like, you know, locate it like your, you know, like, you know what I mean, where it sends you a code and, you know, then it, it connects somehow, whatever. It's, pro- so it's probably like a Bluetooth thing. thing. That's my guess. I'm sorry? It's probably like a Bluetooth connection is my guess. Yeah. But then I started wondering, like, okay, you know, this is a, I mean, I can see this as a good idea only in the sense that sometimes, especially casinos I don't go to a lot, I might not have the card on me. I'm never, ever going to play anything if I don't have a card. I mean, you know, if I'm going to play, like, $10 or $20, which I would really do anyhow, that's fine. But if, you know, you're going to do any kind of moderate to even, you know, medium type gambling, you want to use a card, you want to get something... So I made me wonder why the, the, the MGM or, you know, Caesars or any other win, maybe they do have this technology. I mean, I haven't seen it advertised, but I, mean, I thought that was very cool. You know, you don't have a card, player's card's closed, you don't want to go to the pits, you don't want to deal with it. You just pull out your phone, pull out the app, and everything's right there in real time. And then no one sees your name, no one's, you know, some of the cards will have your names on them where it shows up, no one sees your points. And you know, you kind of have a little bit more uh, an- anonymity to it as well, you know. No one sees it, anything you're doing. So I don't know. I thought that was really cool. And just was shocking to me that of all places, Boyd Gaming had that verse, you know. Yeah, that is surprising. Uh, you know, somewhere on this, right, right, that you would think that. And maybe it is. Maybe I'd probably win has it. You know, who knows? Surf. I mean, I don't know. I, haven't, I don't recall ever seeing it promoted or advertised. But anyway, I thought that was a, kind of a cool piece of technology. I mean, it makes sense, like you said. Um, I mean, that's the way we're, we're going to as a society where everything is just through your phone. Everything you do is through. Oh, yeah, and they also have cashless gaming on there, too, which I, I've, I've never gotten into. But you can deposit money on your phone at, at Boyd Properties now and have it uh, immediately added to whatever slot machine you're playing and vice versa. You know, cash out goes back to your phone. I assume, like, cash out to your bank, you know, right away, like an ACH thing. But they have total, total cashless, uh, you know, gaming there. Well, unfortunately, I do know about that. I know about that, unfortunately, because Viejas oh, yeah, has yeah. that, and that was related to that scandal last year with the bank thefts. So oh, that, that's Global yeah, Payments that's who does that. Thing. 
yeah, the other interesting thing I learned, I didn't play any table games, but I also saw it implemented where at, I don't know if it's every game, certain games, I, I don't know, but the table games now at Boyd, you can get, you can cash out blackjack, craps, you know, whatever, table game, with a Tito ticket instead of cashing out in chips, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that is you interesting. Not, you can ask for you could ask for cash, or you, or they print a ticket right at the table for you, which is when you cash out. You know, they'll color you up and they'll ask if you want chips or a Tito ticket, so you can go directly to slots, which I guess makes sense because you know what, like you're losing or whatever. I only have eighty dollars. I'll put it in a slot. I mean, that's why they're doing it. Yeah, so yeah, they want you, you to go to slots. You yeah, you're more likely to just you know whatever fire it off in something that has worse odds in the game you're probably even playing in a, in a table game. But anyway, I, I made those two observations and. You know, I, I realize I don't get out as much anymore to new. I don't branch out enough to newer casinos or, you know, casinos I haven't been to to see what's going on. And you know, I used to know all these things. I used to know, like, oh, the newest thing here, the newest thing there. You know, I used to know all that. And I'm realizing now I don't because there are just so many casinos now. There's only so much time. I don't have the interest like I used to of going to different places. So I don't know. I found it kind of interesting. Yeah, it's um, interesting. We're going to throw on a caller here. I am familiar with this person because I've texted with him. Call you're on the air. Hey, Todd. Uh, I have a one quick question. I'll make it quick. Is Brandon still on, too? He's here. I'm here. Brandon, uh, hey, uh, you don't know me, but I've been listening for a long time, and I always like when you're on. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I hear yeah. that a lot. And, uh, yeah, I yeah. Thank um, you so much. It's awesome to hear you back on now because I remember back when you were on all the time and stuff. Um, oh, thank you. My quick I have a question for both you guys. So I keep observing well, Vegas uh, from where, a, do, I, do I know who you are? I mean, you're like a forum no. poster? you just a radio listener? No, no, I'm not on the forums, but I just, I've been listening since like 2014. And where do you live, if you don't I, mind me asking? What state do you I live, live in Minnesota. State? Cool. Are you poker gamb- Are you poker player or more of a casino? I, I, uh, I've got never casinos. Uh, I played Play Money Poker on Full Tilt. And then uh, I, I played live poker, one, one $2, like up at Canterbury. But that's about okay. it. Okay. Like I, so I've never even well, been nice to Vegas. To What's your question? Oh wow! All right. Well, but one day so this is nice what the question. But, yeah, nice to meet you too. I've been observing from afar Vegas by listening to you guys, and every time, every other every other week almost, there's another story about Vegas is like implementing more changes that just make it worse for the player, and also things that make it worse for the customer. Whether it's like resort fees, parking fees, you know, all this stuff, but also the stuff they're doing with the games. Do you guys think there's ever a time or a point in time where Vegas can keep going so far that they can actually screw themselves and people will stop going, or is it too big to fail? You know, I, we've talked about this on the show, and I've said my opinion many, many times that I think that they're, they are going to reach a tipping point because of the advent now and prevalency of so many casinos in other states that they're going to get to the point. You know, you have to think 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't like, everybody had a home casino where there was one in the state, you know, right next to them. You throw in also the fact now that, that the people that love the amenity of sports betting don't have to come here for that, that, you know, almost every oh, state has it again, that. like, or, or again, if it's not the state you live in, it's nearby. Uh, they're going to get to the point where people are going to say, why are we here? Why are we coming out here when there's this beautiful Indian casino? Thirty miles. When they're away, nickel and diming me to the away. point where they won't even give me my change for yeah. a dollar, that's what really yeah, put exactly. me over the edge of thinking yeah. I'm never going there. I'm never going there because they yeah. won't even give me my fucking change. Yes, they're trying but to steal a dollar today, from me or whatever. Unfortunately, today is not that day, and profits are still like year over year, you know, record setting. Uh, you know, we're coming still somewhat out of the pand- pandemic and. Casinos are just making fistful of dollars every month. I mean, every month it's a billion dollars plus in revenue every single month. Uh, you know, so until it gets to the point where they start, you know, once they start seeing the numbers fall, when they do, they, they have they to will, feel it in their wallet. They might, yes, exactly. Then they'll have to look and say, okay, what do we need to do? You know, sadly, this is what they'll say. What do we need to do to entice people to come back here? You know, what, what do we need to do? Because, you know, I live here, so it's different. But if I didn't live here and I had a gorgeous resort where there's you know, there's a great steakhouse and great restaurants and shows and, you know, beautiful rooms, why would I want to come here, you know, and be nickel and dime to death? It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah. Where so, you okay, get the so same I'm... kind of amenities. Yeah. So that's that. You know, and I think Druff feels the same way. Uh, and I think we're still, you know, 
some some time far off from that, maybe a couple of years until we might start seeing that that brought up. Jeff, what do you think? Do you agree with with what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's not going to happen as long as the casinos are continuing to do well. They don't care if people complain as long as they're still uh, making record profits and just kicking ass on the gaming floor. They're they're not going to really want to change anything. This is one of these things where you change when you start to think there's a problem. I, I do think they can't just do this in an unlimited fashion where they just keep making things worse and worse and, and nickel and dime more and more. And I think one of the big drivers to this eventually happening will be an economic situation where people just don't feel they have the disposable income to spend here. And then when that occurs, then uh, people are going to start wanting to get more value for their money. Uh, what we have here right now is, as Brandon was saying, there, you know, we're still not that far removed from, from the COVID years and people were cooped up for all that time and, and they didn't get to go anywhere. So I, I know we're not right off that anymore, but, but there's still kind of the feeling that, that people are appreciating a little more than they used to, that they, they can go out and come to places like Vegas, which, that, which was taken away from them for a little while. So, uh, when that dies down and when well, when know, the, there's probably uh, a fallout from the current economic problems, uh, you will have a decline. And, and there was a decline, by the way, after the, the housing crash in uh, the end of 07 and, and throughout 08. There was a big decline in what the casinos were making because people did not come with that kind of disposable cash. And I think that would be kind of one of the external factors that could bring this on faster. Not that I'm rooting for this. I'm not rooting for uh, economic struggles. So Vegas changes. I'm just saying that could be something that would bring it on because there's a lot of people unhappy about it. They're just kind of putting up with it. People are unhappy about the resort fees. People are unhappy about the parking fees. People are unhappy about the ridiculous charges of all the things in the room that uh, the eighteen dollar bottles of water and stuff like that, like it, it just annoys people. But it doesn't annoy them quite enough to say, "Okay, I'm just not coming back." And there's enough going on in Vegas of things that they want to see and do that they're just willing to tolerate it. But when w- when they stop finding the motivation to come here, and as Brandon said, uh, for gambling, that motivation is getting less and less because of uh, home home and near home casinos where they can go that offer near the same thing so yeah all, all this will come together at some the point i think betting factor and the sports and the sports betting factor too you know, remember yeah i, mean, I totally you know, forgot about the sports betting factor yeah i i hear things like yeah. six to five blackjack for example and i get really irritated i'm like that that's your bread and butter game that's been this way forever this is the main reason people are coming there, and now, now you're making the blackjack six to five. Unfortunately, that's never coming back because this was a realization they made that I'm surprised took as long as it did, and that was that the gamblers starting from the 90s were increasingly less informed than the gamblers in the 80s and prior. And, and uh, because of the age I am, I got to see both. Now, I wasn't old enough to gamble in the 80s and in the 70s, but I, I came to Vegas with my parents, and I observed the whole thing, and I discussed it with my parents. So I was very aware in those days that most people who came to gamble and sat at a blackjack table, they knew basic strategy. They would never have tolerated a game like 6-5 to five blackjack. they say, what the fuck is this? You're supposed to pay us 3-2 to two or not playing this game. So people were very aware of what the expectations were. And even though they were not positive EV players, you know, only a very small percentage could count cards, uh, they at least could mostly play basic strategy or close to it, and, and uh, they had an, a proper expectation as to what the rules of the game should be. But then in the 90s, when Vegas became more of an entertainment destination rather than just gambling, then you started having more and more people that were coming to Vegas for reasons other than gambling. And then when they would gamble, they wouldn't quite know what they're doing, nor would it be important to them to know what they're doing. So that was a big change. And for a while, they weren't catching on in Vegas that they could get away with things like changing blackjack to six to five. And then most people won't care that most of the current players only care about uh, how lucky the table is, how lucky the casino is, or, uh, you know the the atmosphere of the table. Uh, so so it's things like that where they're not even thinking about stuff like 
blackjack rules or video poker pay tables. And that's why they've been able to get away with degrading these, and there hasn't been much of a backlash to it. It's the just irony is, the, the irony is now, more than any other time in our nation's history, there's more free information out there on how to educate yourself to gamble as close to perfect as you can, you know, obviously considering that the, you know, added in house edge, whereas like in the eighties, I remember like I'd have to go buy a blackjack book or go get a mag, you know, you know, go to the library. Whereas now you could get literally on the plane ride in the Vegas, you could educate yourself on these games and people just aren't doing it. like, you know what I mean? The education's there, like where the information's there. Yeah. Well, Brandon, you know, I, you I can, can just go on a, I can just Google it and I can literally just print off the perfect guide for blackjack and like one page fits on like one page and I can just like fold that up and put That's it on my wall. Or I can just pull on my on phone. The yeah, right in, on, the ever, on, the, on the plane right in, if you've never studied, you know, you can yeah. learn or never played, you can learn basic strategy. And I mean, it's the same thing like with the double zero, uh, the triple zero roulette, whereas people like still play it. Whereas Oh yeah, that's another like one that really irritates me. Oh my God. Yeah. Five minutes five minutes of simple research like okay we're supposed to stay away from this game we don't play yet you know what i mean no <laughs> yeah, one yeah. It, it, yeah i just it's, i don't what kind of set me off about this was this poker segment you guys just did where i'm thinking to myself these casinos cannot stand the idea that i might use my own brain to count cards like they can't handle that but then like they can use all these sophisticated techniques and technology to try to like pretty much analyze everything i'm doing to get it to the point where they can manipulate things as much as humanly possible to where they're going to win no matter what I mean, I know it's always against me. Like, I know it's negative expectation, but, like, it's just so much of a less fair fight now than it, than it used to be. Yeah, and yeah, you're right. a lot of the people have no desire to learn. It's not even just they don't know how to find it or, like, you can tell them that, hey, this 6 to 5 sucks, here's why, or, or here's why you're making mistakes in blackjack, you know, here's a very quick way you can learn it. And people go, no, I, I don't want to. I, I just want to go sit down and have fun. I, I just want to play the way I enjoy playing. I, I don't want to have to think about it. I don't want to learn anything. I don't want a, a reference card with me. I, I don't want this stuff. So it's because these people are really there gambling for pure entertainment and not because they want to give themselves any reasonable chance to win. And, and the funny thing is, even some addicted gamblers who are going there to gamble aren't really that interested in learning how not to lose as much. So it, it's just a different attitude people have, where, where the gamblers that would come in in the 70s and 80s, they wanted to know what they were doing. And I'm not saying they weren't stupid gamblers then, but there were a lot fewer of them, and they realized it. They realized that people just weren't understanding how these edges could be taken, these additional edges by the casino could be taken and that the vast majority of players and, in fact, the players they want to be there won't notice. And the ones that they don't care about losing so much are the ones who will notice. You know, as I said and Jeff concurred, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight, but over the next five years, there's going to be another four or five semi-big to two big resorts that are going to open. In fact, two weeks from this past Sunday, so the 20th of November, Durango Station will be opening. Now, that's, you know, it's a local casino, but it's still still a half-billion-dollar casino. It's still going to be another big casino in a congested, you know, area that's going to take customers away from somewhere. You know, people that now are going to be patrons and loyal, loyally going there you know, are going to have to give up the prior place they were at. Uh, the guy that owns the Houston Rockets, uh, has a casino that's scheduled to be open in about three years. They just filed plans with the FAA because of the size of it to build a casino on the strip where, um, what, what's the one next to uh, Harris? It's Casino Royale. Yeah, Casino Royale. Right. They're going to they're going to they're, they're gonna, uh, build a mega resort or you know some type of you know big property there. Uh, you know on the strip. Obviously, the Fountain Blue is opening up in like a month or two. You know, so they're, they're going to have five more casinos easily in five years. And, you know, where are those customers going to come from? So, you know, we'll see. I mean, all that's going to add to, to, you know, the inventory here in Vegas now. And, uh, but, I, you know, anyhow, to sum it up, eventually there will be a tipping point. There will be. Where people just are like, it's not worth it. What am I doing? You know, I can get the same kind of gamble. And then, when, you know, if people do become better educated, and as Druff said, it affects, you know, their bottom line, they'll say, why are we going here? Why are we spending this kind of money when we can get the same kind of gamble, the same kind of entertainment, the same kind of food, you know, at our local casino or 30 miles away or our, our regional casino? You know, I remember uh, years ago 
you know, I could tell you every casino in Biloxi and Tunica. I knew every one. I knew all the casinos in, I mean, I still do. I could name all the casinos that are in the Atlantic City area. Uh, I could name every casino in Vegas. And I knew all the big Indian ones. You know, I knew, you know, in Oklahoma. I knew the casinos in Northern California. Now, there's so many new mega, and I'm not talking like little shitholes. I'm talking $200 million and up, like, you know, resorts, mega resorts, resorts that, you know, rival Vegas, you know, that are even better. Like, I can name a ton of Indian casinos that, that I've been to or I know of that are better than Treasure Island, that are nicer and newer than the Excalibur, that are nicer than the, most of the Caesars properties. So eventually people are going to, you know, that's the other thing you got to realize. Like, the infrastructure is getting old here. Like, you know, you only really have, like, okay, let's not count, like, you know, the, the North Strip. But, you know, from, like, the win on, you only really have, like, three or four, like, high-end, like, real nice properties that aren't dumpy now, that aren't showing their age. Like, look, you know, as much as I do patronize them and, and so on and so forth, the Caesars properties are all in disrepair. And there's, you're not showing any signs of, of getting better. Uh, I don't know what the new ownership's going to do, but they've been cutting uh, money, you know, left and right. Uh, and I'm talking about the Venetian and Palazzo. That property is showing its age. You know, it's hard to believe, but the Bellagio is 25 years old. You know, I mean, to me, like, you really have, like, the win is a crown jewel. And I guess, you know, you'd say the Bellagio after that. And, you know, the resor- resort worlds, although we don't know what's going to happen in the long run on that end of the strip, is still, you know, brand new and, and fresh and sparkly. But, a lot of these resorts are, are showing their age. I mean, they really are. And then, you know, don't even mention downtown, where everything other than Circa is just, you know, funny enough, ironically enough, Circa, you know, the words are complaining a twist on words. Everything downtown is Circa, like, 70s. So, you know, that's the other thing you have to think about. The infrastructure is really getting old here. You know, like, you don't see a lot of redevelopments. And, you know, it used to kind of be what they would do would, would, would be, like, when... I moved here, the Aladdin, the old Aladdin was still here and they knocked it down and or it wasn't like a full knockdown, but they, you know, tore most of it down and rebuilt it as kind of what they're going to do with the Mirage into a hard rock. And they, you know, made it brand spanking new into another Aladdin. And then obviously the, the nine 11 happened and people didn't want to stay in a, in a Arab themed casino, but you're not seeing even a lot of that. We're like, they're just kind of maintaining these properties and keeping them fresh. And that's another issue. Like, what are people going to say? Why are we paying three hundred dollars to stay at Caesars when it's like you know the room with holes in the carpet? Or why are we staying at the Palazzo with this dated furniture? And you know what I mean? Like, that's another thing to think about. Do you guys think there's like so many uh, potential tourists from overseas and other countries where it's like even if every single tourist only comes once, it's still going to be totally fine? Because I, I bet you tons well, of people will never come back. They're definitely filling a lot of rooms. They they don't have an issue yet with it, like a big vacancy situation. It it will start to come where if, if there is. Yeah, but you still got about you still got about fifty thousand rooms that are. Being no, I know you have you have a you lot have, of you rooms. Have a lot of rooms over the- yeah, and and if 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 more and more are, are starting to not be very good anymore, if they start to look old and they're and they're not replacing things, they're not fixing things, or just the building itself is already just. Uh, looking old and there's only so much you can do uh yes people will start to think hey why are we spending this much money here but i will say that when it comes to destinations people will somewhat overlook that if it's just a matter of supply and demand I mean, i've gone on a lot of trips myself where i stay in some crappy place but because i'm going to a place that only really has a two or three month season for tourism and because it, there's just not much lodging there compared to who wants to come, yeah, I end up spending 300 something dollars a night for a room that isn't very good and that if I win the off season, I'd get for 70. Like I've, I've had that before. So people will tolerate it even if the room doesn't match what they're paying, if just that's what the going rate is. Of course, it will affect it, you know, if they, you know, people only have so much in their budget and they also will look afterwards you know did i really get my money's worth here i don't think it's gonna be a major factor right now but it is an interesting observation on the point of brandon that yeah there haven't been as many casinos being wrecked recently and uh new ground up casinos being built and in fact uh that's what's 
been discussed recently is that uh, there really have not been many gr- ground up casinos built. That's why, like uh, when Resorts World was built, which was a ground up casino, that was the first one in a long time. Everything else just keeps being uh, renovated. Well, technically, 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 the Circa was before that, but I mean that's downtown, but still, the Circa is a, a beautiful mega resort that was from the ground up. If you take away those two, then yes, then you got to go back a long time. Then you got to then you got to go back to the Cosmo. Yeah, you got to go all the way back to two thousand and and two thousand and ten, when the Cosmo uh, were, or actually started being built in two thousand seven. But uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, you know I guess what I'm saying is you know with, with with the sports betting again and and gambling and everything else, all the things I think that were unique to Vegas, people are going to start eventually discovering that they can have those same amenities closer to home and, and, and the same value, if not better, uh, you know, for, for a cheaper amount of money. And there's not going to be things anymore. Yeah, there's not going to be so many things anymore that are so special that you can only have in Vegas. Uh, you know, that's, that's I think, how I look I at think it. That's, that sounds good to me because that should force Vegas to have to become better. Yeah, it, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So so we'll we'll see. Yeah. Like it, it'd be interesting to look at what Vegas will be in 2033, and yeah. you know what will be different. Will there be much new construction, or is it just going to continue the trend of just renovating everything? Uh, will there be any kind of significant backlash to the nickel and diming and the other things that are irritating tourists? You know, or they're just going to keep going full speed ahead and say, "Hey, we're doing well, so f it, we're not changing anything." It's hard to see exactly when this timetable is going to be. And, and the one thing I will say, Vegas has shown over the course of its, of its existence that it's very, very good at reinventing itself. So far, it has. You know, just, you just think, you know, from the 80s and, and it's a uh, degenerate place run by the mob and it's kind of like taboo to come here to the 90s where they went through that phase where it's family-friendly getting out of being family friendly and you know what ha- happens in vegas stays in vegas and then you know making it more not even about gaming anymore making it about the restaurants and nightclubs and making so much money from that making gaming more of a, a you know secondary in some sense like you know source of income and you know making i mean you have to remember like in the 80s and even early 90s rooms weren't even profitable what's, what's that term like buffet well, it's a loss, loss, loss leader losses, yeah right? that's the word yeah loss right you know Maybe they weren't like losing a ton of money on rooms, but it was it wasn't something where it was like a, a big revenue, you know, generator. Same thing with restaurants, you know. And now they so they have proven that they do transform themselves, but but also we are by far at the peak of of the highest, you know, incline in fees and service charges and add-ons that we've never experienced either. And never, the, you know, the this, this is the worst. Is out yeah, like, I don't know right. they, like I almost think that right. I almost think now what what can they think of next? Like what yeah, else can exactly. they do? They've milked it, you know. They, they really think about well, it. That, that, that's what really milk. blew like, my mind with the refusing to give people less than a dollar and change unless you wait in line. It's like that just blew me. That just blew my mind. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe they're doing that. Like, what else could they do? Whereas, like, it's it's funny because all the local places give out change because they know the locals would react the same way you're doing. They would be, be turned off and be like, "Well, fuck this! I'm not coming here then." Because all the local, all the local, ca- custom. yeah, all the right, all the local casinos still give out change. And the change thing is annoying. Like it's, uh, you know, it's even worse. Is like they, you know, they put up those little messages when you when you put in a ticket that has change on it, asking you to donate the money or just oh give it God. to someone or yeah. There's, oh a, there's, I know that <laughs> I know the Cosmo has that. I know the M- MGM properties have it. I can't remember about Caesars, but it literally gives you an option to donate it. And it's not like to the United Way or Red Cross. You know, it's some weird charity I've never heard yeah, of. Yeah, it's like, oh, they, I'm already you know, stuck, and now you want me to donate money. Well, like, and then you're right. And then I'm sure if we looked it up, which we <laughs> haven't, the charity that we, that you know, if Druff looked it up, would be a charity that, like, you know, rakes a ton that isn't, you know what I mean, that isn't even well run. Like, who knows? But it's like, come on, really? And they have the they have the Fine. authority. I mean, it's a simple thing to hit a button or two buttons to turn that change machine back on. Yet they all none of them since the pandemic give you change. That they won't even give you your change. <laughs> and now what they've done is they've figured a way where if me and Druff both play video poker and Druff's a master and he loses a certain amount and I suck and I lose a certain amount, I'm more likely or we lose the same amount. 
let's say me and Jeff both lose the same amount because we both run like shit, but I'm I'm horrible. They'll re- they'll realize I'm horrible, so they'll start giving me offers, but they won't give Jeff offers. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. as I was saying, though, the one upside to that is the if if they do this too much, the advantage players can start uh, counteracting that by showing up and purposely losing in, in those properties that seem to be doing this, and then fool yeah, them to giving offers. That's more negative EV, though. It is, but it but it could generate even well, higher Druff offers for them. Saying, Druff is just saying you can mask it. That's all he's saying. He's well, I'm sa- I'm saying I'm saying that you you can, can not not so much you can mask it, but that what they think they're accomplishing is is uh, they're going to lose some back with advantage players once they figure out it's happening and where it's happening. Then they can actually use that to get even better offers by pretending to be a horrible player right at the beginning, get all these big offers, and then uh, you know cash out all the free play and go ah I got you so. And they, they always try to stay a step ahead of the advantage players, but a lot of times they fail. So th- this this is more useful, I would think, as as a kind of medium term marketing tool to those that you can tell aren't advantage players, but also don't have enough play in to where you can really tell their skill level. Because someone who plays all the time, you'll you'll, so like, you'll in other words, in other words, a company like Caesars could could use this and they can go through all their seven stars and they can determine which seven stars are profitable at all and if they wanted to either just start DNIing them you know not inviting them meaning not giving them you know comps or even ban them if they want they could go through their whole like you know kind of what they did with with when they eliminated the free room benefit they could you know what i mean just seeing who are their unprofitable you know higher tier members and just stop offering them you know that's that's what they could do with something like that. Well, like like you know, yeah, they could just see. right. You could if they could identify who are the regular or semi regular customers that just uh, have very poor skill at video poker and just lose except when they get very lucky, and they can see this for sure that these are just not skilled players, and so, they can see that these players have been so essence, reliably not playing well. So in essence, they could look at you and me, Druff and I. And say, okay, Druff has lost ten thousand this year, and I've lost ten thousand this year. Okay, but I played bad. Okay, I'm a worse player than Druff, but I've hit a couple of Royals, so I'm only down ten thousand. Where even though Druff is down the same amount as me, Druff hasn't hit any Royals, but he's playing perfect. So they can look at two players that both have lost the same amount of money and determine that Druff is not profitable, and and give me better offers. Than Druff, even though we both lost the same amount of money, because they can see that Druff is the better player. And yeah, and and, and, and and as I was saying, it's like a it's, it's like a good medium term tool because with the short term, they are vulnerable that people can purposely play badly when they're aware of this and, and generate big offers. With long term, they can see anyway without using that tool who's just rel- reliably losing over a long period of time and a whole lot of hands. It's the medium term where you have. Um, more than a, a small number of hands, but where luck could easily be a factor of whether this person's doing well or poorly, and you'd really love to know what is contributing to why this person's losing. Is it because they're, they're playing badly or just because they've run badly? So this will allow them to see that. So that's that can be very useful. And at that point, you have enough history with this person to be able to tell uh, with with you know, pretty, pretty good certainty if they're an advantage player also, and you can eliminate that possibility. So I don't know how these casinos are actually utilizing it that are running this software, but I know if I were in charge of such a department, that's what I would be doing. I would start to use this to identify the video poker players that we're not quite sure about yet what their skill really is and then start marketing to the bad ones. And uh, now this won't really help with slots, which uh, get a lot more play than video poker. But, you know, since you're offering video poker, why not? Why not get the most out of the bad players that you can. So anyway, guys, uh, thank you for uh, calling in. And Brandon, thank you oh, for yeah, being on. Caller, what, you don't have to tell me your real one if you, if you don't want to, but in case you call in again ever, well, what is your name or what would you like to go uh, by? It's just Patrick. What, what yeah, I'm Patrick. All right. Well, very nice to meet you, Patrick. Thanks for calling in and hope you call back in again. Awesome. I just realized I was on here for 28 minutes, so I should definitely <laughs> let you guys go. Okay, okay. Thank you for calling, Patrick. Right, have, a good, have a great day, Patrick. You too. Nice guy. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I've texted with him over the years, and oh, nice. So I wanted to take his call before the show ended. Where you know, if it was a number I didn't recognize, yeah, I, I may have said screw it. it. 
But I'm, a wall. I'm ready to go. Bro. I I, I fit the wall right. too. So I am going to end this here. Thank Every you for. Every time I say I'm going to come on for an hour or two hours, I'm always here all night. With you, you know, <laughs> for the most part. So. So I'm anyway, good. people, yeah, if uh, if you're I'll listening, let you do the closing. Huh? Yeah, I was just going to tell people that this is a long show here, and uh, today I'm going to be uh, probably pretty busy because I'm I'm beating up with uh, you know two different things. Uh, and one one being with Brandon later on, but uh, and I'll be sleeping in the middle of it, so I probably won't have time to edit it today. And then uh, tomorrow I may be uh, busy as well. So the, you may not see this one till Thursday in the archives, but I'll see if I can get it done faster. This is a very long show, so it's going to be longer to edit, unfortunately. But it's even a possibility that this could end up as like a part one, part two up there. So if I think this is too oppressive to edit in a reasonable amount of time, I may just edit the first half and then uh, slap it up as an episode and then the second one. But we'll figure out what we're going to do. Thank you, Brandon, for coming on and giving us all this time. I know you weren't expecting to, but uh, it's done now. And thank you. And I will see you later. And uh, anything you'd like to say before I shut this down? Well, thank you for having me on and, and just always feeding me... Uh my time to speak and i always enjoy it and i'll see you tonight yeah at uh you know where well thank you everybody is uh Hello. probably happy to see you back here which you're not on every week so it's a nice treat for the listeners oh, and yeah we didn't say it. i'll say one last thing we are 9 20th of the way through our football contest did you talk about that tonight a little bit when i briefly mentioned circa and christopher mitchell but yeah we're we're 45 uh, percent of the way through and so hopefully we can continue to make the right pick for the next 11 weeks we have to do this. Then we can be in the winner's circle. So long way to go, but so far so good. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I can't hear the music anyhow, so I'll hang up. I'll let you do the shalom. I assume you still play the same I music do. at the end, the yep. All in the Family? Yep. Okay, I will hang up. I'll see you tonight. Thank you again for having me on and your hospitality. And uh, Good night, everyone. Have a great day. Okay, good night. I don't know why I'm saying goodnight. It's almost 7 in the morning. So, this is a long one, wasn't it? A lot of content here. We've been on... Without a break, by the way. There was no break on this one. You guys don't hear the break, because I edited it out when it's in the archives. But I'm telling you guys in the archives, when you hear this, there's no break. So... I did about eight and a half hours straight here with no break. And the reason I was able to do that is because Brandon was talking too. So I could rest my voice while he was talking. But I will say that I'm kind of burnt out at this point. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to continue. But thank you for listening. And for those of you that like having long shows, especially since we're not on every week anymore, now you have it. And I will place it in the archives when I can. This has once again been broadcasted with a cell phone. That's not the equipment I'm using to speak into, but that's what's been transmitting it to the Poker Fraud Alert server. And that's what I'm going to have to do when I'm in this particular location. If you guys saw where I was right now, you'd be pretty impressed. It's probably uh, not what you're picturing where I am at the moment. I'm talking about the physical place I'm sitting right now. But at the same time, the internet sucks. The next show... Let's see. Today is uh, November 7th. Yeah, the next show may or may not be from this same secret location. Or it may be back in my usual location. But remember... Please listen on YouTube if you can. Subscribe on YouTube for sure. And encourage other people to subscribe. And remember, if you want F1 tickets in a very nice section, contact me. I will beat what the casinos are offering by a wide margin. 775-372-8355. You can text me. Shalom. Shalom.